Nice to see you all uh, here this morning. Uh, welcome to our board workshop this July 18th. Um, Vice President Kerr, would you lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Sure. Seems like a long time since we have had a meeting, Dr. Baker. It's good to see everyone here again, and nice to have us in our board workshop uh, format this morning. So we welcome those who are here for the purposes of addressing the board at the proper time and in the order of their request. If you wish to speak to, if you wish to speak during the meeting, please fill out a form indicating the name on the agenda and the item you wish to address. Leticia, are these the only ones that we have this morning? Okay. You may also make a request to give testimony on an item not listed for discussion today. However, full discussion on any items not listed on the agenda agenda will have to be delayed until such a time as the item can be publicly posted in advance as a regular agenda item. If you wish to ask questions, please address them to the chair and not to any individual members of the board or staff. Let's start with public testimony on items listed on our agenda. We have Karen Wassinger. Wassinger? Hi, Karen. Hi, good morning. Good morning. Um, my name is Karen Wassinger. I'm a teacher librarian at Poly High School. Uh, before that, I was at Lindbergh and Keller Middle Schools where we ran very successful award-winning waste reduction programs. And so I was very excited to get to Poly and get some of those things I learned started there. Um, our experiences there have, are a very good reflection of obstacles faced by many trying to implement green programs across the district. So I'd like to share some of those with you guys. Um, to start with, there was no money for blue recycling bins to get started with basic recycling. For a site our size, it would have cost about $1,500 to get started. Um, thank goodness for friends with City uh, of Long Beach Environmental Services that gave us used bins to get started on basic recycling. We also surveyed teachers to get a feel of where Polly was to get started. These were some of the things shared. Quote, there's nowhere to recycle the stuff, so I bag it and take it home. Quote, I used to recycle, but would then see custodians throwing recycling in the trash. Quote, I gave up because students did not know what could or could not be recycled. Education is a huge component of successful recycling programs. The need is great and it continues. Frustration of recycling teams is real. There's a constant misuse of purple bins and contamination of recyclables. Our teams often find black trash bags, food waste, and landscaping waste in purple bins that should be containing only recycling items. Um, all recycling is done by student teams and volunteers. Recycling should be part of district operations. When trying to rescue good uneaten food to donate to Rescue Mission prior to winter, winter break, I received a lot of pushback from nutrition services. It took tremendous effort, which was really unnecessary. The food was already being thrown away. As I saw when I walk in to collect the food and calf um, workers were actually pouring milk down the drain. Um, we were also denied shared tables by nutrition services unless we could provide uh, volunteers to man them. Um, I have about 100 to 150 students at lunch in the library at any time. Students and staff only get 30 minutes to eat and to have some rest time. We cannot have volunteers run share tables. This could easily be set up and taken down by nutrition services as part of the roles and tasks. It is estimated that 15% of food waste is actually food that can be donated and eaten. Daily, I get students come to me and say, Ms. Wassinger, you got any food, you got any snacks? This food could easily go back to our students, could easily be donated back to our communities. Food rescue cannot happen without refrigeration. We keep on getting told, even though there's no health department regulation stated that donated food cannot be stored in calf fridges, we, get, we keep getting told that. I had a fridge donated from Rogers, had it transferred through transportation services, it arrived broken, it had to be discarded. Thank um, you. Your three minutes are up. We need a top-down district-wide program. Thank you. Thank you. 
Pamela Weinstein. Good morning, Pamela. All right. Good morning. Good to see everyone. My name is Pamela Weinstein. Um, I've been committed to Long Beach Unified for 29 years, and 17 of those I have done site-based green work, including earning the California Green Ribbon at Rogers Middle School. Also co-created the Think Green program with Karen and Danielle Vandevoort. I'm here in support of the green school operations policy and hoping to see even more in the future as it is needed to be in compliance and to show our students how to be stewards of the planet. Here's some background context and examples. On May 16th, Sustainability Advisory Committee met with stakeholders and district admin to gain suggestions and comments. All the suggestions that were given were not accepted and the energy policy remains the same as it presented today. Neither the original policy adopted in November 2019 nor today's energy addendum address recycling. Not paper, not cardboard, batteries, electronics, books, printer cartridges, only to name a few. And just for context, the California law AB 341 went into effect in June 2012, so we are now 10 years behind, which is a big reason why my students uh, many years ago got together and researched these policies. And this policy requires public entities such as schools to divert their waste for um, proper disposal, and many of our schools, as Karen said, have no recycling at all. Um, in the original Green Schools Operation Policy number eight, there has been limited or no follow through with food service related items, which really results in so much of our trash. There has been some reduction in food packaging, but really the only item in a school lunch that is recyclable is a clean lunch tray. Um, the district's supposed to be encouraging zero waste lunches, lunches brought from home, there, there has been no promotion of this. And sharing tables um, for unused cafeteria food, like Karen mentioned, um, has been difficult to attain at many schools. Most significantly, um, SB 1383, effective January 22 and applicable to schools in January 24, um, will require schools um, to divert their organic waste. And it will, which means that we need to start getting a policy and a system together to recover that edible food. Um, it will be illegal at that time to throw out edible food. In order to do this, the district needs a person at each site to man these stations and to systematically get that food from the student who doesn't want it into some sort of receptacle and then recovered and taken to people that need it. According to the documented task force will be formed to monitor these policies. Who will be part of this and how will it will ensure that all of our sites are in compliance? Thank you. Thank you, Pamela. Dr. Baker, I know that we have a big facilities presentation this morning. Ms. Miranda, I know you're gonna to touch on some of the uh, comments today, uh, but in terms of some of the issues and concerns raised, Dr. Baker, can we have some follow-up on that? Sure, and this will be a good time this morning yeah. to do a conversation about yeah. that. Perfect. Thank you, uh, Karen. And was it Karen or Carol? Karen. Karen and, and Pamela. Um, Diana Michelson. Good morning, Diana. Okay, so we'll just start with some typical introductions again. Hi, my name is Diana. I know I've been here quite a bit, but I am a rising senior at Long Beach Poly, so last year at LBUSD. Um, but I'm here today because over the last two years, actually, with the founding of the Long Beach Green Schools campaign, we've been working on passing a Green Schools um, operations type document. We've been really excited because over the years it's transitioned, or specifically over the last couple of months, it's transitioned from a resolution that we were initially trying to pass to actually a board policy. And we were extremely grateful. We've been working a lot with Mr. Rising, who is, he left? Uh, Mr. Miranda and Ms. Mogi. I haven't seen her today, but once again, extremely grateful. We've really had the opportunity to let our voices be heard. It's been an amazing process to you know, work on a Google Doc together, literally type words, and then see it get included in the document. That has been a really empowering um, opportunity that I've had with the district. Um, that being said, there this document, which is incredibly impressive, there's a commitment to um, not buy another fossil fuel equipment, um, to when possible prioritize zero emission vehicles. Of course, you know, if we need to replace 10 trucks that year and only eight zero emission vehicles are available, we'd have to adjust. But 
on the whole, it is an incredibly impressive document and we are extremely excited and once again, extremely grateful. I know Mr. Miranda, once again, thank you so much. We've been working a lot with him. Um, but I think my big takeaway as well is there's still no mention of a date. Um, that's what we've been pushing from the beginning. And I know that there's a task force implemented that is an incredible step in ensuring that this policy is followed through on. Uh, but I think that a date is the real way to secure something. Um, at the end of the day, at the current rate that we're going, if we do transition all of our equipment and replace all equipment with zero emissions, we'll be hitting um, 20, a 20, like mid 2040 deadline for zero emissions anyways. So at this point, it just comes down to, will we prioritize this? And I'm sure I can give you a list of reasons why we need to prioritize it. One of them being that by 2000, uh, uh, by 2100, actually, there will be 37 uh, extreme heat days in Long Beach. So that's over 95 degrees. There are over 275,000 people in Long Beach who are extremely vulnerable to this. This is just one reason. This is a socio-environmental um, issue, and we have to begin prioritizing this. So I think it comes down to, is are we willing to push 2030, 2040? And as a student, as a future poly alumni, LBUSD alumni, I think that it really comes down to, you know, I want to lead this district knowing that my brother and my sister, my brother is going into the fourth grade, my sister is going into the second grade, that they will be left with a healthy, sustainable Long Beach. Thank you, Diana. Thank you. We have Ruthie Heiss, Heiss next. Can you help me with your last name, Ruthie? Heiss. Heiss, okay, thank you. Good try, though. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Ruthie Heiss. I am also a member of the Long Beach Green Schools campaign, and I believe I first started coming to these meetings eight months ago, November, and I first met some of you individually or had the pleasure of meet, working with you beginning December of 2021. So back then I was 13 and I'm 15 now, which is kind of crazy. Um, in the last two years, I've spent my time working towards reducing LVC's contribution to the very same issues I saw threatening Long Beach. Rising sea levels that endanger a port, wild storms that cause flooding, um, fires that turn our sky orange over and over again, and a gray haze of ozone that sits on top of all of LA. So my peers' asthma was continuously interrupting their learning since we seem to have a lot of <laughs> children with asthma. Um, I don't think any of us here agree that this is a reality we want for Long Beach. These concerns brought this board policy into your hands today, including the insight of many different important LBSD voices, teachers, students, staff, parents, and more. Um, not only will this path policy bring us closer to a cleaner and healthier classroom, it will also kickstart LBSD's journey towards meeting state requirements that will come into effect in the next couple years. And like Diana mentioned, a lot of what's written in this policy will help us achieve those 2034 deadlines and make them more feasible than maybe we think right now. With other districts, larger districts like Los Angeles, San Diego, Huntington Beach, Seattle, Miami-Dade, Oakland, and many more passing similar policies and resolutions and already accelerating towards 100% renewable energy, we know this type of transition is the future and a future we are already behind in. Starting now, we'll give LBC the perfect opportunity to make this transition happen sustainably in a way perfect for our students and our communities. I would like to voice that this policy is something hundreds, if not thousands, of LBC students, parents, staff, and community members want to make a reality for their schools. In the past two years of GSC students coming back to you over and over again to voice the same message shows that this urgency others feel to make LBC more sustainable will not go away with time, but get stronger. We are given this unique opportunity through the hard work of facility staff and many other LBSD staff to join a future others are already present in. So let's pass 3510.1 and get LBC one step closer to a healthier and happier Long Beach. Thank, Thank you. you all. Thank you. And our last speaker, is this the last one, Leticia? Is uh, Pete Marsh. I saw you come in, Pete. Yeah, there you are. Good morning. Good morning, board, uh, staff, citizens. Thanks. Pete Marsh, uh, grandparent of three rising Longfellow Elementary Lions and uh, have been uh, happy to help the district and the students with the Green Schools campaign. I, I've heard a number of concerns uh, about 
what it's what what are the risks of this uh, green future and uh, there are six that I've heard most predominantly uh, specificity of the ask cost technology infrastructure risk and goals and I'd like to talk really primarily today about cost which uh, uh, is a big part of your concern about risk so the <clears throat> Since 2019, for three years, it's been cheaper over just five years to own a Tesla Model 3 than a Toyota Corolla, literally 46 cents per mile versus 49 cents per mile. That future is coming to all electric vehicles and all electrified machines for space heating, water heating, laundry, cooking. Uh, we are going to be paying more if we stay with fossil fired machines uh, from this point forward. So um, it, there is currently a small upfront price premium. It's a little bit more in CapEx, uh, but much lower OpEx. My Tesla Model Y costs me around $700 per year for electricity for 15,000 miles. That would cost me $3,000 to $3,500 for a gas vehicle right now. There are some who say technology isn't ready yet for the, the electrified future. We already have all the machines we need to replace uh, fossil-fired machines that are in common use in a school district and most businesses and all of our households, and I listed those purposes already. Uh, one special case among vehicles is trucks, and <clears throat> so I'd just like to emphasize over the last decade, we've gone from where in 2012, we s manufactured and sold only 130,000 electric vehicles in the entire world. This year, we're selling 130,000 electric vehicles every week. So that's a 50-fold improvement. That same future is coming to trucks. Currently, United States wide, there are only 1,200 battery-powered electric trucks on the road of all categories, class three and above. And, but uh, there are 40 manufacturers making 150 different models of trucks, and there are 130,000 orders for those trucks in place. So the future is coming, and Thank you. it'll be good. Thank you. You're welcome. So I want to thank all of our public speakers for attending, especially this early in the morning. And I want to particularly thank the students that, as um, was pointed out, have been coming consistently for, since 2020 uh, now. So thank you for your advocacy, for your public comments, for your involvement um, with our district uh, team's uh, process. Uh, not only have you um, educated us here with your public comments, but you've been a vital part of the process. I'm sure Mr. Miranda is going to speak to the importance of the community engagement uh, piece. So just wanted to thank you and everyone that's been uh, vigilant on our sustainability efforts and have come and shared your perspectives on how important um, what's before us is today, not just for our school district, but for all the communities uh, that we serve. Um, we have two big presentations and uh, I know we'll have two lively conversations and engaging conversations this morning. Uh, and I know we're probably going to take up every single minute of that first presentation, Mr. Miranda. So without further ado, let's move forward with our facilities um, presentation. Welcome, Mr. Otto. Good morning. Good morning, members morning, of the Mr. board, Miranda. Superintendent Baker, senior staff. Of course, our wonderful audience in person and on YouTube. Here we go. So our presentation is now queued up. Um, and you're right on, Dr. Benitez, so why don't we just start there, right, and address the elephant in the room. There's quite a bit to cover uh, via the facilities update there's, at this particular presentation. There's a number of different topics and subtopics. I'm going to do my best to keep the conversation at a very high level, yet yeah, walk the board through each of the different components of importance just to make sure not only the board understands and comprehends the master plan, but so too does the public, right? Because it is a large effort. There's um, um, really quite a bit for us to cover. Uh, I'll go at a healthy pace just to move things along. I want to leave enough time in the presentation for a question and answer session, of course, as well. 
I'll do most of the talking up here for the three major topics, but at some point about midway through, I'm gonna invite Viva to join us to help me speak to the sustainability policy, uh, specifically with respect to the engagement and the process. Uh, they helped us get to where we are now. So what you see listed here on this slide is really the subtopics I'm gonna be covering. Uh, you'll probably take quick note of the fact that they all tie together, right? So the facility master plan, the energy policy we've been discussing, of course the bond resolution that's up, up for vote this evening, all tie in. I'll do my best to transition from one topic to the other and to really identify those tie-ins along the way, uh, but you can clearly see uh, the, the delta, the nexus there. Uh, really what we're looking to highlight, and I'm looking to highlight this morning, and it's really embedded in the facility master plan, is the need. So what do we have left to do? What's out there in terms of capital improvements um, for the district to embark on? And not only addressing the need and identifying what I would describe as a problem per se, uh, but how can we perhaps solve that problem, right? What's the solution to get us where we need to get as a district? So we're gonna start off with the master plan this morning. Of course, most importantly, this plan is very much informed by a number of different individuals. So architects, engineers, industry experts to really help us get to where we are uh, to date. Uh, this master plan, uh, sure, was performed in concert and with input from various different stakeholders, including facility staff members, quite a few facility staff members. Rather, we leaned heavily on the architects and engineers to perform their study and just do it in an unbiased fashion, right? So they're coming into our district looking at the nuts and bolts and different components, different infrastructure systems across every single campus to really take stock and identify what we need to do, propose recommendations, identify key takeaways and so forth. The plan itself uh, is close to 500 pages, right? So we've been discussing then, uh, this off and on via previous facility updates and presentations. My overriding goal was to, and our overriding goal as a district was to present this plan in chunks, more digestible chunks, so the board and the public can comprehend what this plan fully entails. And I'm gonna continue that effort today, right? So just walking the board and the public through each of the different categories, again, addressing key takeaways and so forth along the way. Uh, of course, I'll look to do that today to bring it to a close, uh, because before you this evening will be um, a, an agenda item to adopt this master plan in its entirety. And, and again, we do have this master plan before you in its entirety at this point in time. So the master plan process really took us the better part of a year. Um, I'd say 11 months and change uh, got us to where we are today. We started last summer in earnest with the facility um, master plan architect who's Canon Design and their engineering team physically walking every one of those campuses I mentioned. So opening up every single doorway, walking interior and exterior spaces, verifying site information that we had provided them as district staff, confirming certain things, right? So this is in fact a different plan and I wanna highlight that at this point in time. We've had previous facility master plan updates as this uh, district has embarked on various capital facility improvements. This plan is not an update, right? So typically with updates, we, we go and update cost estimates and projects and just things we've captured from year to year, um, sometimes decade to decade. This is a new comprehensive report. So we really started from square zero, going out and walking sites, looking at information, fully taking stock, to develop the report that we have before you today. I mentioned several site visits and wanna thank a number of folks right at this time, right? So the schools opened their doors to us, custodians gave us time to kind of walk facilities with our architects and chime in and give us their input, which is super valuable as well. Uh, there's a number of folks in this room uh, who chimed in on this plan, right? And I'll get into the engagement piece a little later, uh, but really big kudos to the Green Schools campaign, to a number of folks in this room who've helped us via different subcommittees um, and help inform this plan in its entirety as well. So I'm gonna do something I often do and just oversimplify, right? <laughs> so the facility master plan is really comprised of seven categories and it's the seven categories you see listed before you and via this slide. So we have our purpose, our process, our results, our recommendations and so forth. I say oversimplify because some of these categories are, lo are a lot more meaty and beefy, right? Uh, the facility reports section in particular. So I mentioned this plan in its entirety is close to 500 pages. I believe it's 488 uh, altogether. Well over 400 of those pages are those facility reports. So within a few slides here, I'll actually jump into a sample school report um, with the attempt and goal of 
just walking the board and the public through at least one sample report for one particular school site. I picked McKinley for this exercise. And we'll just walk page by page through some of those highlights, and then you'll be able to gather what each of the corresponding and subsequent schools uh, look like, what, what each of those reports entail uh, throughout that section. There's also a number of deep, deep components that are embedded into each of these subsections. So we've talked about sustainability. Um, it's listed, it's actually included towards the tail end of the appendix of the report, yet sustainability is embedded in at least half of the project priority categories that I'm gonna be discussing in a little while, right? It's really at the forefront of what we're looking to do in terms of our future capital improvement projects. And then of course, finishing up with acknowledgements because again, there was a number of folks, dozens and dozens, if not hundreds, who participated in the creation of this report. So what was the purpose? And some of these uh, slides are gonna be redundant. You've heard some of this inf information over the course of the past year, yet some folks might be tuning in for the first time and don't know what a master plan really is. So a master plan really serves as a roadmap for capital uh, improvements in the future, right? So a lot to do. Most districts find themselves in a situation similar to ours where there's more need than there is dollars available. And that certainly is the case for us uh, today certainly was one of the key takeaways for Canon Design and, and the architectural firm as they embarked on this, this project for us. Uh, so again, it's gonna serve as a roadmap, help us identify key priorities, help us take stock like we envision doing, and, and really just identify project priorities going forward. Also gonna align us with our educational mission, mission and vision. So this is something I hear as I attend board meetings regularly, right? And there's presentations from other folks, other administrators in the district. And often the focus is on the education, the student achievement, the, the overriding goals of this district. We also know facilities and education go hand in hand. So it's very difficult, sometimes impossible to offer up a certain program if you don't have the facility that's right sized or you don't have the facility that has adequate energy, you know, just electrical sockets to be able to plug into. So this is where the tie-in and that nexus is, is built into the facility master plan, and that remained a focus of ours throughout this entire effort. Then Dr. Benitez, you referenced uh, stakeholder engagement, which I would cover as part of this presentation. That was a large part of this, right? So not only was this plan informed by industry experts, a number of different folks who are in this room, very much informed by stakeholders of our Long Beach Unified community. Um, teachers, students, parents, non-parents, um, everybody chimed in and really just informed us and let us know what they'd like to see in terms of future improvements. Uh, perhaps um, give us kudos in certain areas where we're doing good with respect to our current building program, yet identifying things to help gear us towards the future. So there was in fact a number of key takeaways and a lot of this information, by the way, including some of the graphs and images you see embedded into this presentation, our direct takeaways from the facility master plan report. So some of these things might seem very familiar and that's by design, right? So again, just highlighting some of the key takeaways, our buildings are old, right? <laughs> Several of our buildings, many of our buildings are just aging and continue to age. You know, as I embark on a number of different measure E community-based meetings as we embark on those type of projects, I've been highlighting for the last couple of years that the average age of a building in Long Beach Unified is 63 years old. Via this effort, and again, this was very helpful for us, we now learned it's actually up to 67 years old, right? So these buildings continue to age. It's something we need to address going forward for certain. Uh, the little graph that you see in the image to the top right identifies when these buildings were added to our existing campuses and you see just a spread across the board, you see certain periods in time, if not decades, where there wasn't much construction going on, right? You see a number of buildings were built in the 40s and 50s and 60s. Those buildings have, in many cases, outlived their useful life. In some cases, they're just screaming for major uh, facility overhauls, correct? We've done some of that, which we're super grateful and appreciative of. Um, another opportunity for me to thank the community uh, for the passage of Measure E which has allowed us to embark on a number of different facility improvements, adding HVAC systems, changing infrastructure, um, embarking on different improvements at our various campuses, just to get us clo much closer to 21st century learning environments, yet we know there's quite a bit more to do. Um, we've covered this via previous presentations as well, but it was absolutely highlighted via this master plan, and that's declining enrollment and underutilized capacity in the district. 
So we know at one point in time, and you see it via the image to the bottom right, uh, we peaked, right? So we had quite a bit in terms of enrollment. We're close to that 100,000 mark. And we had to add seats over the years to be able to accommodate that enrollment. We did what most districts do, right? So adding buildings where we could add buildings, yet in many cases, adding portable classrooms. And that's the right play. So that's often the right play for school districts, including Long Beach Unified, because that enrollment could be here to stay. It could be here for the long haul, or it could start to dwindle down, which was certainly the case here. So now a couple of decades later, we've seen some of that enrollment decline. As we go out and visit campuses these days, we see empty classrooms in some cases. Um, in many cases, we see schools spreading out just to better utilize all the different spaces and the square footage that's on their campus. Uh, from a facility perspective, that can hurt us, right? So, you know, with that many portables on our district, and we have several of them, um, you know, we're maintaining those spaces also. We're cleaning those spaces on the operational side of the house. So it really starts to use our resources on, on really what we would call temporary student facilities or student housing facilities versus focusing all of those resources on our permanent square footage. And that's one of the recommendations, one of the key takeaways from this master plan as well. Third key takeaway is really expanding the needs um, of our facilities for our diverse student population. Uh, that's one of the big benefits of Long Beach Unified, of course, right? Our diverse student population, our diverse community. Um, our schools are all different too, which I enjoy just working in day in and day out, right? Every day we walk into a different project, we work with different architects. They very much respect the architecture and the unique nature of the different communities, and we keep to that, right? So we make sure we don't come in, put our hard hats on, and just build a building that doesn't fit on a particular campus. Everything has absolute tie-ins, and there's absolutely that respect in mind. Now, what do we mean in terms of facility improvements for this diverse population? Uh, perhaps this space is unique uh, to our special needs students, right? So in many cases, those are larger spaces. Uh, sometimes it's spaces that include the ability to lift a student and, and get them from point A to point B. Those come with various different structural updates, right? So again, unique spaces often requires some dollars associated with them, uh, but we wanna make sure those spaces are situated in the right place on campus as well, and never an afterthought, right? Um, we've often discussed career tech spaces, which are very neat spaces. Often they're larger spaces, often they include a whole lot of power, different machinery and equipment uh, that gets our students career ready. We know there's quite a bit more to do just in that regard as well. And then another piece, which I'll highlight in a short while, just as I glanced at Brian Moskovitz here, early childhood education, right? So we know we have a new grade level before us. That's gonna entail unique circumstances, which I'll get to in a short while. Some of these slides we've covered, uh, but I felt they're important to bring back again. So again, these are all with respect to our community engagement and really the differentiation from previous master plans to this master plan. Because I feel we did more as a district in terms of just being super intentional, reaching out to different stakeholders, and really what you see before you in the next couple slides in particular is different subcommittees, right? So we had um, a district planning committee, which included a lot of different district leaders uh, within the district, uh, but they all came, came in with their input and their expertise across their specific area of work, which was very neat and very helpful for us in the creation of this plan. We had a stakeholder advisory committee as well. This included no district leaders, right? So this is strictly community-based, volunteer-based. So I thanked every one of them for, for their time as often as I could. Um, included a handful of teachers, some folks from the Taub side of the house. We had CSEA representation as well. Students were part of that committee. In some cases there was crossover, but in many cases we had different folks in each of these rooms. Cannon did a good job of quarterbacking every one of those sessions for us. Uh, they used some very neat tools and technology that was available to them that wasn't available for us in previous master plan efforts. Uh, so folks who would engage via these sessions, uh, many of them being Zoom sessions, would have the ability to still jump in and add notes um, to, to our slides and, and our information we were gathering, right? Um, perhaps they joined a meeting a little late at one particular session, they'll still have that ability to catch up, review notes, via the tools and technology we had available. And then of course the furniture piece. This actually started in our facility master plan. Uh, so the architects in the room, their consultants uh, who joined them as well, helped us go down this path. 
At one point, we pulled it out of the master plan, though, because it, simply put, it was go time. So for us to be able to hit our marks in terms of implementation and add the new classroom furniture in every classroom in the district within that three-year stretch we set forth to do, we really had to get going on that effort. Uh, so we, in, in essence, pulled it out of the master plan, jumped right into implementation. Regardless, we got quite a bit of valuable feedback via that subcommittee. Continuing on with that theme of subcommittees, there was a few more. Uh, so sustainability, and this one was very engaging. Uh, so again, this is one committee where Cannon and their team, uh, Eric was actually the, the architect in charge of that particular committee, really did a good job in terms of setting forth some fun exercises for us, right? So just posing certain questions and getting a ton of dialogue. In many cases, and I truly mean this, um, you know, the students did such a good job of being engaged, uh, all, all of the adults in the room just kind of backed off, right? <laughs> we let them stay at the forefront, we let them continue to dialogue and engage with us and inform this master plan because it was great information, right? So there was no need for any of, of us to just jump in and, and kind of steal their thunder. They were really gearing us down the right path, which I loved. Not only did we have a number of different stakeholder committees, um, we wanted to, to just, again, be super intentional and get feedback via different formats. So Canon helped us design a survey that went out to the public. We did our best job of posting that and, and publishing that everywhere so folks could chime in and give us their input with respect to, again, not just current needs, but proposed future needs on the facility front. And there was a ton of feedback that we received via the surveys. We also embarked on a couple community forums, community meetings where we opened the doors and met in person over at Browning High School. Um, first community forum, not too well attended. It was actually smaller in attendance, but very good in terms of the feedback we got from those folks, right? So in essence, we gathered around a smaller table um, and engaged in very meaningful dialogue that also helped inform this master plan. The second community forum heavily attended so we filled the room. You'll actually see a few pictures here of the interactions that were happening on that particular evening. There was good food to go around that particular day as well. I don't know if that's what attracted the crowd, but we'll take it because there was quite a bit of input we received um, from the various different folks who attended that community forum. All in all, over 600 participants, right? So 600 different hands into this master plan. And it's really more. So I identified via the previous slide some of the different subcommittees, uh, the number of meetings that we engaged in and, and so forth. But there's also all the other conversations that happened offline uh, with the different folks, right? So sometimes the phone conversations, several different emails, uh, just different ways that we dialogued, not just on the architectural team, but the district in-house facilities team as well to gather the feedback we were looking for. So what did we find? I, I highlighted some key takeaways early on, and those were early takeaways, by the way. Those were things that were just glaring in terms of excess capacity, older facilities, and so forth. Um, additional takeaways and the, and the results and recommendations that we, as we started to frame them are really embedded in this particular slide. So something we've heard via, via board discussion, um, parent meetings, student dialogue, teacher feedback. We've just heard this across the board over the course of the last couple of years, and that's this need for additional green space. Um, this was also a, a really the number one comment we heard via the survey findings in particular, which was very neat for us. But for me, it just kind of led us down this path of true alignment, right? So if we're starting to hear this type of comment via surveys, via staff presentations, via board meetings, it, it's screaming out to us in terms of proposed area uh, where we need to perhaps put some dollars to and, and embark on some projects. Uh, equitable access to programs, of course. So we've, we've been discussing some career tech spaces we have. Previously, I've pictured or, or demonstrated via picture some of the cool spaces over at Jordan High School and, and other high schools in the district. Um, Browning, who I just noted a little while ago. Yet there's more to do. So we know that students, parents, community members are itching for, for more in terms of some of these type of improvements, in particular with respect to some of these career tech spaces, right? So making sure there's equitable access would equate to ensuring that the programs or offerings I have at one particular high school and one region of the district are also spread across the different regions in the district. 
Student wellness came up quite a bit, which was refreshing, so that was great to see as well. And this could mean a number of different things. Perhaps it's play spaces, perhaps it's gathering spaces, uh, perhaps it's just a, a space to unwind, right? And you're gonna see that embedded in the priorities uh, that we're gonna set forth uh, within a couple slides here as well. Really what started coming across loud and clear was again something I, I noted a little while ago. More need than there is dollars available, right? So the more we dove into the master plan and, and just soaked in the information truly, um, we saw, you know, we really have our work ahead of us. There's quite a bit to do, yet we're gonna have to capture a, a different funding source to be able to achieve these very things and align us with that very educational mission and vision. When all said and done, and, and Canon and their team of cost estimators put pen to paper, uh, what they realized and took note of was 3.5 to $3.8 billion of current need on the facility front. What scares me is that number is only going to continue to climb, right? So previously I've shared with the board, we're dealing with issues of labor shortages, supply chain issues, uh, material cost increases on the construction side of the house, a lot of regulation that we deal with uh, on the facility side of the house as well. Those numbers are just going to continue to tick up, perhaps get us closer to the $4 billion range, maybe even the $5 billion range, because again, buildings will just continue to age year by year and decade by decade. We also set forth uh, 10 project priorities, and we've discussed these. We actually discussed the, these via the early June board presentation. I'll be very brief in nature in describing um, at least a handful of those again this morning, but we know what those are, right? Um, what I wanna highlight this morning is that alignment of those recommendations though. So every one of those 10 project bucket, priorities, bucket priority sections as I describe them, um, really fall in line with the feedback, the surveys, the community um, forum information we received. You know, every one of those input gathering sessions led us to those 10 project priority sections. So of course, starting first and foremost with major facility enhancements. So think of this category in terms of renovation, modernization, rehabilitation of current spaces. Again, to get us closer, if not right at that 21st century learning environment section. So what can this entail? Uh, you know, perhaps maximizing natural lighting classrooms, LED lighting, just to keep getting us towards the future. Um, new technology as that continues to advance. Um, clean spaces, modern spaces, you know, things with current technology. Um, and we know that changes year after year as well, just as technology advances. Whoops. I'm actually going to go back. I didn't cover wellness. So with wellness and green space, again, a comment we've heard over and over and over. Perhaps how can we address this and, and tie in uh, to some of our problem areas? Portable removal, right? So we know there's excess space. We know there's excess capacity. I just highlighted how that hurts us on the maintenance and operations side of the house as well. The simple removal of portables in many cases, um, in particular where, we ha where we've had the major declining enrollment, can allow us to, to repurpose that footprint or that space on a campus. We have thoughts and visions for adding green space uh, to those sites, absolutely adding green space to sites that don't have any, uh, in particular on the play side of the house. Uh, so that's at the, you know, of importance to all of us as well. There are gonna be several categories or several campuses where they're still holding on to their enrollment, right? So in those cases, perhaps we remove portables, add in a new building. Right, so a new permanent building, building up also helps us save on the footprint, right? So going with a two-story structure will allow us to at least create, you know, more play space or perhaps more outdoor learning space, right? So that's really what's at the forefront of this particular category. Earlier I touched on pre-K and TK expansion, and that's something that's in our world right now. Um, doing a good job this summer in terms of outfitting every uh, transitional kinder space and kinder space with new furniture which is very neat. I uh, just want to highlight the fact that it's going well. Uh, it's a massive project, <laughs> yet right now we're on schedule and things are progressing as planned. We know with uh, TK and K and those grade levels in particular though, there's certain unique needs, right? So we want to make sure those classrooms aren't just available classrooms on a campus, they're available classrooms and well-defined classrooms in a certain part of the campus, right? So in many cases, that's a space that's within close proximity to a school nurse, uh, definitely within close proximity to a right-sized playground and right-sized restroom facilities, right? 
Uh, want to also highlight at this point in time parking and drop off because we envision that as an absolute tie into this particular category. You know, with the TK, uh, the little ones in particular, it's not going to be your, you know, your kids that are biking and walking to school, the ones that are dropped off at the curb and set on their ways. In many cases, if not all of those cases, there's going to be the hand holding and walking them to and from the campus. In as many cases as possible, we should really look at um, expanding our parking lots as a result. Sustainability, uh, of course, a category we've just been discussing for at least a year and a half, two years or so, um, and that's a good thing. So I highlighted the fact that there's at least half of these project priority sections that include a sustainability component, and I think you see it, right? So if or as we expand or built upon our, our well spaces, our green spaces, we're, we're going to be environmentally conscious. As we renovate and modernize spaces, we highlighted how we're not going to go with fossil fuel type um, systems and mechanical systems, right? There's a number of additional categories that are going to follow, but you're absolutely going to see that connection to sustainability, not just in this standalone bucket, <coughs> rather across several one of the buckets that we're presenting today. There's going to be quite a bit more with respect to sustainability in the slides that follow, so I'll save some of that information. Um, but start thinking about certain projects, right? So additional solar, additional renewable type projects. We've done quite a bit as a district, but we know there's more to do in that regard. Health and fitness, another one of these topics that came up via the input gathering process, but has also come up via our board dialogue and discussion in previous presentations. So we know there's quite a bit to do as we walk school sites and, and see some gym spaces that are tar starting to show their age, um, some locker room spaces, just some fitness rooms that are out there. Uh, we know there's quite a bit of work to do in terms of parity and equity in that regard also, right? Because some sites have a little more in terms of that available space, whereas some do not. So that's gonna behoove us to identify those spaces, not just in this master plan, but then go forward and identify those spaces as we roll out an implementation plan. We've done quite a bit as a district in terms of safe campuses, right? So I want to highlight some of those things and then identify perhaps a couple areas for growth for us. So fortunate as a district that we did quite a bit of work with respect to single point of entry uh, on every campus, and that's really benefited us uh, in terms of ensuring our campuses are safe. Uh, we've done quite a bit in the way of cameras, in particular at the secondary level. Uh, again, another category where, where we know there's a little bit of more work to do. And then our uh, visitor screening systems, right? So that's super helpful. You've likely visited school sites where you buzz in, you check in, you identify yourself, your purpose for being on the campus before they let you into the campus. Just super helpful. We're actually currently in what we call phase two of our visitor screening system process, where we're identifying a, a second point of entry in many cases uh, within close proximity to pick up and drop off for some of our after-school care programs. Um, in many cases, those are on a far different extreme or end of the campus, so it's going to behoove us to add in those type of systems. So I mentioned cameras and how additional cameras can help us across the board and, and as a district, uh, and it can. So that's certainly a recommendation that's built into this master plan recommendations. Um, but we've also talked quite a bit about uh, additional site access control. So currently, we're embarking on that type of project via electronic door locks at four school sites and different facilities across the district. We'd like that process to really serve as more of a pilot project to inform us on what we do next. Uh, but all indications are that's going well, that's been super beneficial to us and our stakeholders and really our customers at the school site level. And we can envision a day where we embark on that type of project district-wide. I've mentioned, uh, I think Mr. Miller asked me a question, and it led to this answer previously, where one of the very indirect benefits of having site access control and electronic door locks is everybody wearing their ID badge, right? So that's one of those absolute benefits out there, just knowing who's on your campus at any particular time. Folks would, in fact, wear their ID badge because that's now going to double as their key card to get into spaces. Instructional technology, again, continues to change, continues to evolve. We're doing our absolute best to embark on and enhance classrooms as we, as we go through the Measure E program and renovate school sites. We'll continue to keep close tabs on what the latest and greatest features are out there uh, so we can stay in line um, with, with what the school industry is doing. With this particular category, what we envision is quite a bit more in the way of infrastructure, though. Think fiber, cabling, 
those type of backbone systems that are just in need of updating, right? There's more and more, more and more we're putting into school sites and into our educational system that, that's just technology based. And of course, that means the backbone needs to be updated in that regard. Career techs, uh, I won't spend a whole lot of time on this particular category. We've highlighted uh, this section quite a bit. We just know there's quite a bit more to do to get our students career ready. Um, and of course, hit different parts of the district boundary. It's actually the last slide on project priorities. Uh, community gathering space, professional development space. So this is something I touched on, on as part of the June 1st board presentation. And, and what you see pictured there is browning. And, and that's by design, because again, we used um, that particular site for our community forums. We've previously used that particular site for board meetings and just different gatherings as a district. Uh, we wanna make sure we don't tax that site all that much, right? So it really behooves us as a district to try and find something more central uh, where we get folks to engage centrally in the district, where we get folks to attend our board meetings perhaps in a more central location. And that's something we have identified via this particular category. We also know our TRC space that's used for professional development additional meeting space as well for the district and, and different folks. Um, primarily, actually, I believe entirely, I'm looking at Allen comprised of portables, right? So those spaces have absolutely outlived their life or are getting close to that point. Um, and we know there's something we need to embark on just to improve that particular facility. That one's very well situated, right? So in terms of access and, and freeway access and being central, it's a great location. We just know there's a bit of work for us to do to get that facility up to where, where it should be. Okay, I'm gonna switch gears briefly. I mentioned earlier that I wanna walk you through just one particular school site and I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna choose McKinley. So I figure that's what we do here. Uh, what you see pictured is actual pictures of pages pulled out of the master plan and that appendix section in particular. Um, every school site has those type of pages, right? So if you were to pick on Jordan or Milliken or Emerson, any particular school, you're gonna find that four or five pages that follows for that particular campus. So I'll be brief and just walk you through some of the highlights uh, of each of those sections. But what you see in what we call the facility assessment summary is a number of different indexes. So one of them's labeled education, the other one's labeled facility condition, and the other one's labeled capacity. And you see a score attached to each, each one of those categories. So I would just wanna highlight very briefly what each of those scores entail, and I'll actually go backwards. So in terms of capacity, that one's crystal clear, I believe. <laughs> you know, a, a good score would be good utiliz utilization of permanent school capacity, right? So I have an enrollment that's X, I have a capacity that's Y, how, much, how many of those kiddos are attending or getting instruction in permanent building space? And that's really what the purpose of that particular exercise was. Uh, with respect to facility condition, almost what it's, what it's sounding like, right? So think of the different building components that are out there, be it electrical, plumbing, sewer systems, those type of um, features. And our architects and engineers assigned an index uh, just to be able to rate what each of those systems are currently functioning at, uh, what their useful remaining life is, to get us to a score. What you're likely gonna see is the schools where we've embarked on on measure E updates are gonna be associated with a, a good score. Perhaps the schools where we've yet to get to our measure E program are gonna have a score that, that's hurting a little bit. And then the other index identified education, I believe, um, don't think of that in terms of academic achievement or what we're doing out there in terms of teachers and educators. Think along the lines of that uh, connection uh, that I described earlier. What, is our, what are our educational goals, mission and vision? How do they relate or how can we go do those things via the current facilities we have? I'll also shed light and kind of remind folks of our educational specifications we set up in facilities. So we actually had a different architectural firm a couple years back help us um, align ourselves on the facility side of the house with educational specs. So this would be that score. How are we doing wow. with respect to meeting our educational spec? In some cases, that's things like the size of the classroom, um, you know, the availability of different unique spaces for, for special ed, for different program offerings in the district, and do we hit those marks?
this sheet's actually one of my favorites because I just love cheat sheets, right? So having at a quick glance and at our fingertips, those fingertip facts that we all know and love. So square footages, number of classrooms, number of parking stalls, um, acreage for particular school sites. And of course, that was all informed via a massive spreadsheet uh, that's part of this process as well. But these fingertip facts have actually already proved useful for us via different departments, right? So often we get those phone calls from the maintenance side of the house or operations side of the house, the education services side asking, David, how much square footage do we have in the district? David, how many classrooms total do we have in the district? We now have an absolute update uh, via this well-informed exercise, which is gonna be very neat for us as a district. Mr. Mr. Uh, Miranda, uh, board member Kerr just pointed out that McKinley was constructed in 1934. Uh, so, a little, little trivia, what's the oldest elementary school in our district? When was it constructed? Oldest elementary school? I don't know, I may have to phone a friend and call Alan Rising here. Lowell <laughs> Elementary School. <laughs> what's, what's the is, date is of construction? 1920, don't quote me, and it's 23 or 24. So almost 100. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Great, great trivia. <laughs> What you see next is a few aerial images for this particular campus and a whole lot of color coding. <laughs> so really what we want to identify here is differentiation of permanent building space versus portable building space and identifying each particular building in terms of their facility condition index. So in some cases we've built schools in their entirety all in one shot, you know, maybe in 1923 or 34. <laughs> Uh, in several cases, though, we add buildings over the years and over the decades. So one particular building on the site might be hurting quite a bit from a facility perspective, whereas some of the other buildings might be in decent or good shape. So we want to make sure on a campus by campus basis, we're identifying the, the actual need and facility condition by building. And that's what this image does for us. And then the, oh, actually the next overview section is one of my favorites because this one here really starts to identify particular observation and notes on a campus by campus basis. And again, this is something we set forth to do as part of this master plan to have a school by school assessment and list of recommendations that we wanna embark on or should embark on from a capital improvement standpoint. And this, this section in particular starts to get us there. So with McKinley, some of the key takeaways for me via that note section was you see a whole lot of play space out there uh, but it's all blacktop, right? So we don't have much, if anything, in the way of green space. We certainly don't have much in the way of um, trees providing shade out in that particular area. Um, and we know there's actually another really cool improvement that Canon recommended via this master plan, and that's having um, painted surfaces to really reduce the heat in index in particular locations, this being an ideal one for that. So if you just kind of peruse through the master plan, those site assessment reports, you might see those particular themes repeated over and over. And then the last section for, for that particular category is our nutrition services plans. And I'll just kind of focus your efforts in on the left side of the image, so where you see the floor plan. Um, really, this is something we see across several one of our elementary sites in particular, small spaces, right? So spaces that are not conducive to good fast speed lines to get kids in and out of that space and, and give them more time to eat and play, of course. Uh, what's proposed here is a small building expansion. And this particular building expansion includes a space for um, cold and dry storage, basically. So having that particular space set aside as part of the, the new building footprint, as we would propose it, allows us to repurpose and maximize the current building footprint. There's also quite a few notes embedded in this report with respect to the dining spaces on our school sites. Again, just of absolute equal importance. How do we make those spaces more inviting in particular? Uh, and that's a particular category where our, our nutrition services folks commented on quite a bit. How do we make our spaces more inviting so kids wanna come and eat lunch here? So next we have sustainability as part of this facility master plan. And that's something we've been discussing also for the good part of the last year and how really our goal and our charge has been how do we incorporate sustainability, clean energy, and other components and embed them into the actual implementation and actionable goals, actionable goals in the master plan? As we embarked on the various exercises and, and talked to the sustainability com committee folks and just other stakeholders who took interest, um, what we saw is everything was aligning across 12 different categories just on the sustainability front, right? And several of those were addressed during public comment today. So, 
addressing food waste, addressing recyclable, recycling programs, addressing renewable energy and so forth, and, and many, many more, right? So all important. Um, for us, it was a very useful exercise just to put everything out there at the outset, identify some potential goals that we could embark on, um, and, and really kind of get us centered and focused perhaps on where we could address some things such as what I'll call low-hanging fruit, right? Is there certain things we could and should be doing out there right now? And Canon and their team helped us identify that very thing. So in terms of the sustainability investments, I, I titled the slide this way because the report is titled as such as well. So again, if you peek at the appendix section of the facility master plan, you'll find the sustainability report prepared by the consultant. And they basically categorize goals and actions that we can embark on as a district on the sustainability front across each of those 12 buckets. They also helped us identify, um, based on industry knowledge and their industry expertise, and also based on incorporating some of the feedback we've been talking about, um, where is that low hanging fruit? What should the priorities look like on a scale of one to five? Uh, so that particular report identifies every one of these different types of improvement, helps us gear towards perhaps the priority one items first, then growing into item number two, number three, number four, and so forth. Um, they went with a very cool kind of Yelp restaurant review approach of identifying a cost factor to each of those, these components. So you might see one dollar sign versus two versus three or four, and that just puts a price tag to, to each of these proposed improvements, which is very helpful for us as well. I, I thought that was very neat in terms of that particular report. We also know that we've been describing this report as a living document or a living report. So right now it's a snapshot in time, but we want to and we will continue to, to update this report uh, via staff updates internally and perhaps priorities change and shift, right? So there could be something that's a priority one right now versus a priority four or five. Some of those things may flip flop based on additional feedback and comment we receive. There's gonna be more in my presentation with respect to a task force we wanna develop but I envision the task force playing a, a, a hard and heavy role in that regard. Any, do we want to take maybe a few questions on that facility master plan section first before diving into board policy? Let's Perfect. do that, Mr. Miranda. Perfect. Colleagues? Well, I, I'll start us off. Um, back where there was a slide showing enrollment over the, over the years, um, it seems to me that our numbers are nearing the numbers that we had um, in the early 1900s, which really surprised me. And I, I think we have school campuses older than Longfellow because the district itself is over 130 years old. And I know that our, our first high school was poly but not where it, where it sits today. It was in a different location but it was badly damaged in the 1933 earthquake. And so um, most likely we had other school campuses as well that um, were damaged in the 1933 earthquake. But I think um, Ereta, which was formally named Lee, might be one of the older campuses that we have. You're right. That's a great observation. And for us, as we put on our facility hat, we think, how do we get back to our permanent square footage, right? So if we were, in, if we, if our enrollment was such and it was better aligning with our permanent square footage before we started adding on several portable classroom units, it really feels like it's gearing us back towards that line. Any additional notes, questions, takeaways? Uh, so, so can we sort of uh, step back to the big picture that you started with, Mr. Miranda? And, and I'd, I'd love to hear from Dr. Baker and exec staff on, on this sort of broad uh, question. Um, so you sort of frame this around how facilities go hand in hand and capital improvements go hand in hand to our district being able to fulfill our educational mission and vision, particularly around excellence and equity. Um, and, and I love that you started off with the major considerations, right? We have aging facilities. McKinley, 1934. Lowell, 23 or 24 or 22 around there. I'm going to follow up with you on that one, uh, Alan. Um, we, we are in a different place 
Also, just as an educational system than we were even 20 years uh, ago, not, not even going back to the last uh, century. So when you talk about a different era of education, it's, it's also I embedded in our shift uh, to just accessibility and just different technologies and, and different needs of a 21st century uh, educational system and economy. Um, so um, I, I want to add just one more observation with uh, Ms. Craighead's comments around decline in enrollment and underutilization. It's expensive to continue using space that we needed for 100,000 students, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's cheaper just to downsize uh, either, right? So, so the complexity to me around underutilization uh, juxtaposed with decline in uh, enrollments is important for the last sort of consideration, Mr. Rand, and this is the big uh, one, the diversity of our student needs, all right, and the communities that we serve. So um, I, I'd love to hear just a reiteration, Mr. Miranda, and, and again, I would include Dr. Baker and the exec team, on how closely connected our facilities and capital improvements are uh, to uh, meeting the needs of our students uh, at this point. And, and that includes, you know, potentially students with disabilities, uh, right? Potentially issues around equity. What keeps on standing out, and, and, and when we briefed uh, Mr. Miranda, is the conversation we had with the students at Jordan and multiple students talking about their parents and their families not wanting them to go to Jordan, uh, right? So in terms of a community school and the role that a community uh, has vis-a-vis -vis having pride in the school, uh, not just in terms of what it looks like, although that's super important, mm -hmm. uh, but what kind of education uh, we are delivering at the school. A student said, my, my mom, I remember this vividly, changed her mind about Jordan, and now she wants my younger sibling to come here, and, and she attributed that, along with some of their students, to the improvements at Jordan, right? That Jordan is now a school, from an outside perspective, with stigma, that was attached to it. And I'm not even getting into right or wrong, base or baseless. Uh, there was a self-acknowledgement there from that student's family that they did not like that school because of the stigma attached with it. So the, the, the broad end of the question is, please reaffirm, rearticulate, reiterate for us how important it is to have facilities that allow for our district, that are necessary for us to fulfill our educational vision and mission, Mr. Moran. You I'm just wondering if you want to spend a little time talking about the equity advisor that was part of the Canon team and kind of the, the approach because you named that this is not a, a revision to prior plans but you started at, at zero and built from there and I think that was certainly a way that you helped to operationalize an excellence and equity vision through this process. Maybe start there and then... Absolutely. So there's a good point in time for me to give her kudos as well, right? <laughs> so she was another instrumental part of our team as well. And frankly, you know, when Canon interviewed and was competing with different firms, that was one of the components that edged them over the top of their competitors, right? Bringing forth an equity consultant to their team. Uh, this particular gal was with us every step of the way. Uh, she was with us helping us inform our approach via different meetings and different dialogues. Um, really pushing us in certain cases, which I absolutely appreciate it, right? So have we considered X, Y, or Z? Um, let's make sure we don't forget about our, our language interpreters and, and have them available for this particular meeting or that meeting as well, right? Just at every turn, we were talking equity, right? Which was, it, it was refreshing. It, it was really good. The other piece I want to highlight is, and it's tied into this master plan, of course, and you probably see it embedded in, in a number of these project priority categories, you know, often I find myself as I'm presenting, speaking to the classroom spaces, the learning environments, and we absolutely wanted to make sure we did not lose touch of the other spaces on the campuses, the kitchen spaces, the multi-purpose rooms, the dining spaces, the auditoriums, libraries, media centers, of course, was a focus of one of our last um, project priority sections, but every one of those is super important, right? From the wellness side, the student gathering side, just kind of the well-rounded student, as I call them, right? So everything absolutely ties in. We know students are going to be a whole lot more focused as they embark on their daily activities if they're well-fed and they had a good breakfast. We, we need the facility to be able to do so. 
Uh, we know the student's probably going to be more focused if they're engaged in some play throughout the day versus just sitting in the classroom. You know, I referenced furniture, which is an absolute game changer for our district as well, right? So having the ability and, and the furniture that serves every one of our different unique students, and again, on the equi equitable front. So even as we embarked on that particular exercise for feedback with respect to the furniture we're going to embark on, we heard from a number of different stakeholders. We had open houses in different parts of the district uh, just to absolutely get that buy-in from all of the stakeholders, right? But we see it. So... Uh, you know, Alan Rising and myself, we visit school sites regularly, not just in this district, but with neighboring districts as well. And, and I think that's when I often see more of that tie in, right? So uh, I won't pick on a particular district by name, but perhaps when I visit a facility that's not checking all those boxes that we are, right? That, that's when it jumps out to me even more. And I start thinking along the lines of how can they offer a good educational program if there's no natural light in this space? If, if you know, the kids are focused or distracted because the classroom setting is just not right. Um, and th those are the type of things we were discussing regularly uh, via our exercises. How do we set forth, and we hate calling it the 21st century learning environment, right? Um, but how do we have the right learning environment for stu students in our entire district? Just, just uh, that's a great segue or lead into the question and, and comment that I had that is, is similar to Dr. Benitez's, and you talk about this 21st century learning space. Um, I think one of the slides that's most telling for me is the construction timeline from the 20s, the facilities on the facilities age and condition one, um, and all of the building, obviously that was done in the 30s, uh, early 40s and 50s, and you talk about that lull. And then we, we started some building, you know, in the OOs, and, when we give these presentations and when we have meetings with the community, we tend to do those meetings in the newer facilities. We highlight Jordan's media center. We talk about Browning's facilities. We talk about the advanced manufacturing lab at Jordan. Those pieces that have been built with future learning in mind are those spaces that are um, most critical to the work and most critical to the community. And I know as a parent, even walking into Longfellow um, and going back into schools and for folks who have been in this district for generations, they walk into classrooms that they have made have gone to and there's minimal changes. Like there's a projector on the ceiling is the difference. So there is this static where a majority of our facilities are locked in time because it takes a major renovation or a complete rebuild to align with what we hope is the education of now and into the future. Um, so I think that timeline is really telling, um, and especially to uh, the diverse student population. We talk about our special education students. We know that um, our medically fragile students and students who require additional facilities just to get through the day, those are at our newer facilities where those students are being best served, and we're trying to adapt older buildings to make them work in the best way possible, but we know that at Dooley, which is one of our older, newer older schools, <laughs> however we want to say that, mm -hmm. that there are adequate facilities. We know we're building a whole new building at Jordan to address that. McBride was built with the intention of serving students with disabilities at every level. Um, so understanding that diverse population, and when we talk about 21st century learning, as you said, this isn't about tweaking what we have, it is how do we envision um, and make the best opportunities available for every student moving forward. Um, so I just wanted to, to add that because those are the things that I think of um, that we really do spend a lot of time talking about our, our older, newer schools or even our newest, newest schools. Um, and I appreciate um, those 488 pages that talk about every school site. And while they're doing phenomenal work and our teachers are doing great and our students are working hard, they're there's work to do to make sure uh, that that continues in a more vigorous and intentional way moving forward. So thank you for all. Right on. Great comments. Oh. Go ahead. Oh, thanks. Um, <clears throat> how are we addressing the future as far as trends in enrollment? I know we've been experiencing declining enrollment for several years now, but how are we anticipating enrollment trends in the future and how does that fit in with our um, projections as far as the temporary buildings and and that type of thing great question so 
part of the exercise we embarked on was in fact a look at our enrollment and enrollment projections just in the in the formulation of this particular plan going forward though and again i spoke to the fact that this report is a snapshot in time we want to make sure we continue to look at that trend so working closely with our research folks our educators just different stakeholders in the district to reassess on a year-to-year -year basis um, we know early childhood a TK offering should help us a little bit, right? Just in terms of additional influx of enrollment here in the next handful of years, which will be great. Um, yet I'm also going to bring the conversation back to portables again in our existing space, because the master plan sets forth a game plan for what we could do with portables. I mentioned certain projects that we could embark on with removal of portables in addition of, of new permanent buildings, removal of portables in addition of green space or outdoor learning space. In several cases, though, we might want to also hang on uh, to a certain percentage of portables, right, just to have that swing space. Um, what if we get a, a sudden spike in enrollment? We want to be ready for that. Uh, last thing I want to do as a facility director is embark on a project where I eliminate a bunch of portables and two, three, five years later, add in two or three additional portables, right? So I think we'll always have that swing space for, for you know, just different fluctuations in enrollment. Uh, but also because some of the projects we want to embark on will really entail conversion of existing space also. So we know in many cases right now we have sites with smaller classrooms, right? Perhaps those smaller classrooms, we want to start tearing down walls. And instead of having a row of three rooms, we have two larger size rooms, right? So it's really going to play with our formulas and our numbers in terms of what capacity starts to look like as our building program goes down the line. And then that constant revisiting and looking at enrollment, right? Just to, just to see where things stack up. This is also an area that utilizes external tools as well as internal tools. So working with census data, we go back to why the census data is important for a decade worth of, of um, opportunity for us to use data, but then also internal, tool, uh, internal tools working across business and the level offices around what we see happening in specific neighborhoods. Um, but a really good, I think, just use of tools to make decisions about, about the future, both internal and external. One of the things that, that struck me. Well, one of the things that struck me in studying this and reading about things is that, you know, this works because it's a public school system. It gives us a flexibility with 21st century learning. Uh, it gives us flexibility with, uh, I mean, we, we learned that students can learn in different ways in the last two years than we ever thought that they could, uh, not that we advocate uh, people uh, learning at home necessarily, but it's going to change. And what we have in a public school system, in the Long Beach system, is the ability to do things that individual or even clusters of private schools couldn't do because of all the things that, uh, that, that have to go on. Uh, not only is it the data, the, de the demographic data, but uh, uh, it's, it, it's just critically important that, uh, that we emphasize that we're not good because we've got a bunch of sites that we're individually uh, dealing with, but collectively, uh, it's very important that uh, we, we think of this as a system and that we can move people around and we can do different things. And uh, I don't know, I, I haven't thought clearly through yet how that affects our planning, uh, but I think that it, 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 it has some role. And uh, so I don't want to lose sight of that. For sure. Yeah, to the community members that may be watching and are thinking, okay, so, you know, there's, we need more money for facilities. Uh, basically, if we need around, if the need was identified at around $3.8 uh, billion, uh, I would just, you know, remind folks that if we are educating for the purposes of the knowledge and the skills that we need in the century, you talked about career tech ed as an example, Mr. Miranda. We, we don't have capacity right now uh, to truly, uh, you know, educate students for what they may need in the next 20 to 25 years. All uh, right, so yeah, fabulous tour of Jordan. It's fabulous looking uh, at, at, the, at, at, the, at the ways that we deliver instruction, but not all of our campuses uh, are adequately funded right now. When we talk about funding and folks hear about 
you know, districts in our district in particular getting additional funding. That's not money that we can use for the kinds of capital improvements that are needed to, as an example, if the cost of labor continues to go up because we have shortages of skilled labor and we can help to produce critical shortages in California through CTE, through those sectors that get grant funded through CTE, then we need the facilities to make that happen. Uh, right. So on the one hand, we can't say, hey, why don't we do more CTE without the funding? On the other hand, with, without this facilities master plan, we have no way of identifying what's needed at what schools equitably to be able to utilize if, if indeed we acquire additional funding. So thank you, Mr. Miranda. Uh, just on a closing note before you move on to the next section, we haven't gotten an update on surplus properties. Uh, in a while, so if we're talking about underutilization, and then you know we went through this phase where we were getting sort of ongoing uh, updates on sur surplus properties, it'd be good you know down the line uh, to get an update on where we're at with our surplus properties. Right on, and we've made some headway there, so I'll make sure it's part of our next facility update. Perhaps we we include that update. Thank you. Perfect. So we'll switch gears slightly because again, every one of these components and and subsections are all tie in and go hand in hand. So I want to speak to our energy policy for, for a little while here. And actually at this point in time, why don't we have Viva start making her way up here? Because I'll be brief in my comments. <laughs> so first and foremost, we've talked about engagement in particular with respect to the facility master plan. But we also know there's been a ton of engagement in terms of getting us to where we are today in terms of an update to the board policy. A lot, lot of student leaders in the room uh, who have chimed in and participated uh, via the, the various uh, engagement efforts. Again, I highlighted a lot of different phone calls and emails we've received from a number of different folks who are not in the room, and it's been fun. It's been fun to just review and soak in the information, to look for connections uh, in certain points, which there absolutely was, and that really helped inform the policy that we have before you today. Um, so I'm highlighting here a few key groups of stakeholders who helped us in this process. Green Schools Campaign being one of the key uh, groups that we've engaged with over the better part of a year plus, uh, I'll say. Um, our Sustainability Committee, uh, primarily led by Christy McFagan in the district, but engaging and talking to a whole lot of educators in the district, getting feedback from, from those particular folks with respect to what we're doing uh, on, on the clean energy and green side of the house, perhaps identifying things we're not doing, right? And, and really helping us via those particular discussions, tying in the educational components, right? So what are we doing in the classroom to better inform uh, our kids, our future leaders uh, on what these impacts are as well? We also had um, an environmental sustainability committee that was part of the master plan effort, right? So I highlighted that we had at least three different discussions with that particular group. Also highlighted the fact that there was some overlap. So some of the folks who participated in one or two of these committees could have participated in all three actually and it just shows their passion for this particular topic which we can appreciate so i'm starting with and again this is a slide we've shared before board policy 3510 and a summary of our current green school operations board policy that was adopted by the board in late 2019 so this particular green school operations policy entails a number of different things that really impact um, and coincided with the work of different departments in the district, be it transportation, nutrition services, the maintenance side of the house, certainly the operations side of the house, because some of those particular areas of work and, and goal settings um, in, include those operational type components, the actual products we use in and out of different school sites, right? So these are just some of the highlights. Uh, we didn't want to put the, the entire policy before you again, but these are some of the highlights and takeaways we took from the current policy, which really led us down the path of developing 3510.1, which we want to discuss next. So let's have Viva up here to discuss process. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. <clears throat> um, so I do want to kind of go in. This is a brand new policy that is an extension of the Green School Operations Policy. Uh, this was a process that began before I started at the district. Um, in 2020 and when we say there was a lot of engagement um, this was over a dozen meetings with um, various stakeholders and what we took that as is like a listening and learning from both both sides and 
Um, we talked not only about just this energy policy that's in front of you today, but about sustainability, environmental justice, and the impact of climate change. So for me also, it was a great like learning opportunity to really understand what's going on the state level, local policies, and other school districts. So I did a lot of research on what's out there right now, what are the state mandated policies, do we need to update this, and um, one of the key things that we heard directly from students is that they wanted a new policy because they wanted something that was like clear and achievable. And so after gathering so many different types of policies and trying to understand what is also achievable at a local school district, um, we were able to kind of learn from other school districts as well, but also learn from the students and um, decided to actually um, draft a brand new policy that I kind of like first drafted and then we worked line by line with students. Um, it was, got a little bit messy at times, but I think that what the goal was to be able to have a co-created policy that we both felt like we were united and that we worked through a lot of the details that um, David will kind of like really expand on as the expert to be able to um, draft something that the district will feel very proud to be able to achieve with around energy and also the students felt like they really had a chance to be able to not only um, put in their input but actually some of the languages in there are student kind of like they drafted it for us and so um, I felt really honored to be part of this process and I think one of the um, big highlights that it will say in the policy is there's going to be three clear implementation goals that the district will take on and um, I'm going to pass it back on to David so he can like walk through what those are. Thank you Viva and thank you for giving me a breather. <laughs> so a couple of those highlights and I really want to focus in and key in on those three particular goals and implementation sections that Viva teed up for me. So first and foremost, and there's a word that just jumps out to me here or two words perhaps and that's energy focus. So for this particular exercise and, and taking from, from what Viva just described in terms of perhaps you know, some of the process and dialogue and discussions get messy at times, it's because it, it became overwhelming, right? With sustainability, I previously discussed 12 different categories. There's probably more, right? Uh, more categories just uh, from that different section. So what we saw just at a quick glance was, let's start taking this particular work in digestible chunks also. So we thought the, the right approach at this point in time is to just focus in on this new policy, 3510.1, with an energy focus in mind. Um, and then we'd go back and revisit, engage in quite a bit of more dialogue to address some of the other categories, because we do, in fact, still need to do those things. By other categories, I mean the recycling, the food waste, those type of items as well. It's just going to entail a lot more discussion, right? So we've talked about the engagement efforts with the Green Schools campaign and other stakeholders via different committees and how that's really taken up the better part of a year, right? So it, it may take us quite a good chunk of time, if not several months, to engage with various different stakeholders to talk about those other sustainability categories as well, right? So again, that's why the energy focus at this point in time. With the different goals, and they're outlined here in items two, three, and four, uh, just in terms of a quick visual, and these are just direct words we took um, from the proposed board policy that we're gonna have before you that will be up for vote. So the first one being, um, yes, um, really what we do in terms of our major, major capital improvements. So we know right now we're embarking on quite a few Measure E projects. They're HVAC and modernization related for the most part. Yet in some cases, we're doing work in terms of new buildings. We referenced Jordan a short while ago. We have a new building we built at Millican just a short time ago as well. And there's also a number of athletic-based improvements that we embark on from year to year. Uh, really what our goal will be effective immediately is to shift gears and go away from fossil fuels and go into more clean energy building components, machinery, and the like. Um, and, and again, just informed by industry experts, informed via this stakeholder gathering process, and we'll be further and more deeply informed via this task force we want to create. So we know we've set forth these goals. Um, our heart is definitely in the right place and we want to hit those marks. Uh, that task force can help keep, it, keep us honest going forward as well. So we know via the task force, they'll be there to help us, you know, go down the right path, help us report on what we've done as a district, help us identify perhaps or even dialogue in terms of the reprioritizing that I discussed a short while ago, because that might happen as well. And then we'll be right back in front of the board. Um, 
we know we can go this route. It's much easier to do with new building construction efforts because we're just designing things from the ground up. Uh, but we know there's also these type of improvements and elements we will absolutely incorporate into our modernization scope of work. Um, and we can do that right away, in particular on the projects where we've yet to design uh, those improvements, right? Because there are several that are, are just too far along or finishing construction at this point in time. We want to let those play out. Part of that also entails a phase out schedule. So, and I actually just teed it up for myself. So there's a number of projects where we're finishing construction or we recently completed construction efforts uh, where we still have some of the fossil fuel technology, right? So there we want to let those systems live their life. Um, I, I don't want to put a date range to that because those could differ based on the different school setting, the different life cycle of those specific components. Um, but regardless, we want to commit as a district and via board policy to in fact phase those systems out when the time is right. Um, and we'll identify an actual implementation and phase out schedule that we'll work on next. Uh, next is vehicle emission reduction. So, and I agree, I think Mr. Marsh alluded to this, Diana alluded to this as well, just in terms of where, where society is, where the industries are, and they've advanced quite a bit, right? You know, those of us who watch TV see a lot of commercials out there nowadays in terms of different vehicle offerings. They've all been tasked with getting us to cleaner energy vehicle fleets. You know, there's grants available on occasion for, for clean energy buses and so forth, and we're gonna go chase after those as best we can. We know there's actually a big effort we need to embark on on the front end though, and that's our infrastructure, right? So if we're gonna have a clean energy fleet, we need to have charging stations spread across the district as well, not just as, at our primary facilities where we store the, you know, where we have the bus yard or the maintenance vehicle fleet, but at different points in the district as well. Um, so the infrastructure piece in particular will be very big. Uh, Diana, in her, in her comments, alluded to a, a very cool scenario that I want to tie into as well, right? So that's the purchase of perhaps 10 vehicles, right? So maybe at that point in time, there's only eight vehicles on the yard available for us to purchase. And then I think we just revisit that particular point. Let's, in fact, buy those eight vehicles that are clean energy based. But then what do we do? Do we buy two perhaps that are just um, reduced energy in a sense, right? Not all the way there, but still get us part of the way there. Or can we table that conversation for later in taking stock and working hand in hand with our maintenance folks and fleet operators? Um, can we wait a little while to purchase those additional two vehicles? Perhaps um, and perhaps not, right? But those are the conversations we'll be having going forward. Whoops. And then the task force, um, because I absolutely want to highlight that. I'm sorry, I skipped one. Renewable projects. So, uh, and I highlighted this as part of the previous presentation on the master plan front. We're already in the early planning stages for some additional renewable work via solar carports, um, but we're gonna continue to revisit that particular topic really, you know, every year at least, right? If not more often, just to identify potential school sites where we have that large electrical demand um, and do we have the footprint to be able to do something out there as well. And closing with the task force in this particular subsection. So, Embedded in the board policy that's before you is the creation of a new task force on the sustainability front. We identified it as such that there will be at least seven members on that committee. There could be more. Um, I imagine there's gonna be quite a bit of interest to serve on that committee as well, even though it's gonna be volunteer based like several of our committees. We'll task somebody on our facility side of the house with quarterbacking that process as well. Um, and we have good talented project managers and, and folks on our side of the house who can do such, right? So what we envision is regular meetings, regular updates, sharing of information, perhaps revisiting priorities, and reporting back to the school board at least annually, just in terms of what we've done to reach our sustainability goals. Additional next steps, because I feel that's actually the key one for us, um, the creation and establishment of this committee, right? So what do we do next? What do those metrics look like? What type of folks are we looking for? Previously, I gave a comparison of our Citizens Oversight Committee only because of, you know, meeting frequency and reporting and the like, uh, but also hitting different uh, positions, right? So on our Citizens Oversight Committee, we have representation from different stakeholder groups. I envision we would do the same thing on this Sustainability Committee as well. Uh, we know there's further research for us to do. So we have our work cut out for us in terms of really taking a deeper dive into these other sections, uh, because again, truly focused on energy at this point in time, only because we feel the conversation had, has advanced so far in that regard. Uh, we're not gonna lose sight of those other green components. Actually, that's gonna be on our, on our to-do list going forward. And then per, 
that will likely lead us into perhaps another new policy, if not another policy update, right? So that's really what you see there in terms of future board policy conversations and updates. And then bond resolution. Uh, really just want to... Can we take go a ahead, pause Dr. at Benitez. the... Yes, the, let's, field, yes. let's field some questions and comments there. On the, uh, the policy that we'll be taking action on tonight. Colleagues, any questions or comments on just the um, proposed policy? Mr. Miller? Thanks. All right, so I had a couple of questions and comments. Uh, first, I'll go to the what I would think is the easier one here in regards to um, 3510. Uh, with implementation goal uh, number two, it says ensuring that the facilities, constructions, renovations comply with the green building standards. Are we talking about all new projects moving forward being LEED certified? Or are you saying that just the construction standards will be uh, under our uh, green building standards. Please help. Uh, yeah, so uh, this particular that. reference is really, really with regard to our new green building code uh, that the state is putting before us. So the state architect, who we funnel every one of our project plan and approvals and, re and reviews through, um, updates their building code, um, but at least every three to five years or so, correct, Alan? Three years. So the new update in particular is, is what we're all referring to as the green building code, right? So we know we're going to have to match up and, and already tie in to the green building code in across every one of our building efforts, um, both on the new construction and modernization side of the house as well. So I, I hope that answered that particular part. Um, in terms of lead, that's actually identified as a potential goal um, in our sustainability plan that's, a, that's embedded in the facility master plan as well. So we know that that's a particular item of discussion. We just want to engage in a little more dialogue there. I can't recall offhand which priority point that was given in terms of that priority one through five section, uh, but we do have a reference to potential lead certification in the master plan as well. And also um, in relation to that, but not necessarily uh, speaking to the lead certification piece, uh, earlier it was spoken to that when it came to our students, uh, they had the statement that students want thing, wanted something that was clear and achievable. Uh, they've been a part of this process the entire time. Everyone understands that when we're talking about achieving a goal, there has to be strong standards set and a timeline. Uh, that was spoken to earlier about the request of a timeline uh, on such um, policy here. but. Unfortunately, we weren't able to provide that. Can you speak a little bit to uh, kind of what the thought process was and um, upcoming um, information on this we'll do. piece? So while perhaps there was in direct alignment with respect to setting a, a clear timeline for some of these improvements, there was absolutely direct alignment in terms of having items that are clear and achievable, right? And I think that's what, where we hit the mark. So if you review not just this board policy, but also take a deeper dive into the sustainability report that again feeds into the master plan, but, all, but can also be a standalone document on its own. Uh, I, I feel strongly that's what gets us there. So there's clear goals identified. There's clear priorities with dollars assigned to them. Every one of our building projects is gonna have sustainability in mind going forward. And, and we're definitely committing to that as a district via this board policy. And I feel that particular tool, the sustainability report, I'll call it, it, is going to be a reference tool as we have these task force meetings, right? So we're going to go back and reference that particular goal setting tool, the report itself, and just go line by line and identify what we've done, perhaps what we haven't done and why, right? So in the, in the case of the vehicle example, we'll be able to describe, look, we wanted to go out there and purchase 10 new vehicles that are clean energy. There was only eight available, right? <laughs> so I think we'll have that very dialogue that's super direct. Um, but I feel the sustainability report gets us there in terms of having clear, actionable items that we'll be able to, re to report on. Okay. And mm, I, I agree. I know for me personally, when we're uh, talking about uh, the larger goal, right, um, uh, I am a firm believer in uh, setting high achieving goals. Uh, and you hear the cliche, uh, aim for the moon and you land in the stars. I, I think that having um, uh, firm dates 
um, um, even higher achieving than the expectations held to us by the state uh, would be beneficial within uh, this policy here. So, um, but I know that you all are working uh, really hard on obviously not only meeting the standards that are held to us by the state, but at the same time, I personally would feel more comfortable with having uh, firm standards put in the policy. Sure. Um, yeah, just building on Mr. Miller's um, thoughts. So I also agree um, for the aspirational goals, and, and it's actually based uh, for the most part on what you and Alan have briefed us on, uh, David, that the state in some, in many ways, has already set 2030 and 2045, uh, right? So even if we were just to be in compliance, and, and, and I know we're shooting for more than that, I think it is important. I think it, it leaves embedded institutionally uh, in a policy beyond potentially our service here, right? You know, 10 years down the line, I may not be uh, here, but a policy that we're considering. Uh, would, would reflect that. So I do think it is worthwhile, e even if it's only, and I'm not trying to trivialize or minimize, with things that were already targeted by vis-a-vis -vis state, uh, timelines and targets would be important because then within that, the strategies that you're talking about specific to, you know, that moving target of do we have eight cars or 10 uh, cars and, and, and when do we transition, you know, in terms of timelines for fossil fuels, those are the details, all right? Those have to be revised, changed, based on contextual circumstances. But the aspirational goals are still there for us. So I, I too, would, would ask staff to, to consider uh, attaching some alignment uh, in those aspirational goals uh, to, to, to some target dates, for certain. Yeah, and Mr. Miller, Dr. Benitez, um, I know Alan and myself both really often pride on myself, always pride on ourselves to do more, right? So the building code will always require uh, us to do X, Y, and Z, we're constantly looking to more, do more, right? And this would be no different for us as well. Any other comments or questions, colleagues? If, if not, then let's move on to the bond resolution, Mr. Uh, Miranda. Perfect. So last section of our presentation, and we'll be on our way. And I think we're right on in terms of time. So bond resolution, uh, really what we've been discussing uh, this particular morning, more so than the previous board updates, is the need that's out there. Uh, Dr. Benitez, uh, several board members really emphasize this point and help me kind of get there as well, just in terms of uh, identifying equity, that tie into education, of course, how we can't do X without Y. Um, it's been very helpful in this discussion this morning, even for myself, right? The master plan was really geared towards taking stock, setting a roadmap for the future, identifying project needs and priorities, which it's done. Uh, but really what it's also done is just put this big uh, mark on what that need is, right? So 3.5 to 3.8 billion today, we know that dollar's gonna continue to climb. So I just wanna reiterate those points, right? We also know that we're, we're working hard and heavy on Measure E right now. So all of the projects we set forth in Measure E and via that program are, are you know, in the works and in the planning stage. The, there's funding allocated to each of those respective projects. And we're not losing sight of that. So everything we've promised voters we're gonna do in terms of those HVAC modernization improvements, you know, the adding of a new field, synthetic turf field to secondary school sites, the aquatic center projects and so forth. Not only is their funds earmarked, uh, there's been early planning, several of those are complete, right? It's still very much our mission to go and finish every one of those projects. So I wanna make sure I separate out kind of the work of Measure E, where we are, uh, where we're headed over the course of the next, you know, four, five, six years or so and differentiate with this actual need here, right? Because this need in particular not only feeds off of the master plan and each of those 10 project priority buckets, but I, I strongly believe it gets us further in alignment with our educational mission and vision, right? Being able to add in um, the adequate facilities we need for early childhood education, uh, making sure that our campuses are as absolutely safe as possible getting our media centers and facilities up to par with what you saw over at Jordan High School, right? We need to see those type of facilities elsewhere in the district as well. And we've talked about career tech, equity. Um, we just know we need to embark on different type of projects, many of them very unique in nature across different parts of our district boundary. We can only get there with additional funding. And you teed this up for me perfectly, Dr. Benitez, but that's where this bond resolution comes into play. So 
one of the requirements that's set forth uh, upon all of us and upon board members is before getting before the, the registrar of voters and, and putting this on a potential ballot for voters to vote on, we have to first take this action where we adopt a, a bond resolution as a district that really sets the calendar of different events in motion, right? So there's absolutely deadlines with respect to getting on the November ballot for another potential bond measure to get us, you know, and start chipping away at this project list uh, via the master plan projects we've identified. Um, the bond resolution that's before you for vote this evening includes a number of different references to government codes and education codes and, and codes galore, so I won't go through every one of them, but it's, it's really consistent with the bond resolution we had in the past, right? So if we, if we date back to 2016, you're gonna see a number of the different or same code references and ed code references that were before you at that point in time as well. Wanna highlight, so this is actually a proposed ballot measure text that I'm putting before you right now, right? So this is included in the bond resolution uh, that's, that's agendized uh, this evening, but really just looking at that first sentence in itself, because I think that's the highlight, right? Or really where we've capitalized um, the, the particular phrases. So it, it just, those things jump out to me. Repair, student health, safety, achievement, right? These are all things we highlighted this morning via that particular presentation. And it just so happened to work out that way. We've been working on the language, we've been looking for consistencies and alignment with our facility master plan, all these different exercises, uh, the creation of those 10 project priority buckets and the language in this resolution. And as I review it, all of those documents, I see the consistencies and alignment for certain. Uh, last but not least, and then I'll field questions on this particular topic as well just some of the major highlights in terms of the ed code references. And, and these are gonna be, again, consistent with our Measure E program. Um, when we go, when districts, lo local educational agencies seek out bond measures for capital improvement projects, local bonds, um, we have to comply with a number of different things, a host of things, including things that really make us transparent as a school district and community, right? So actual reporting, auditing, uh, the creation of citizens oversight committees, which we've done for previous bond efforts as well. Uh, but by and large, what you see here is transparency. Um, we feel co very confident that, that we have the staff and the resources to be able to support uh, a building program. Uh, super excited at the prospects of embarking on these type of projects, right? To, to be able to go and really impact our educational settings and communities alike. Um, and really hit the mark in terms of excellence and equity for this district from, from the building side of the house, right? So this is the funding source that helps us get there. Um, as you can see, the, the proposed bond that's before you is for $1.7 billion. And we highlighted 3.5 to 3.8 billion in need. So we, again, we're gonna be faced with a situation where we have more need than there is dollars available, but we know we need to start somewhere, right? And as we prioritize projects, embark on these type of improvements, it's really gonna put our district and our students in a better position. With that I can field questions on the bond resolution. Or, or any one of those items. Well, I believe um, in 2016, when we were talking about Measure E, we had identified needs in the amount, I think it was close to three billion, but we passed that bond for, I think it was 1.2? 1.5. Or 1.5. So those needs, that were identified in 2016 that um, would not be covered by the uh, uh, funding from Measure E. Are we addressing those needs? Or have they been rolled over into the needs we see before us with, with this bond? Is that, is that part of it? it? It rolls into this new facility master plan. Um, so every one of those needs and new needs, right, because things just continue to change and evolve, are all embedded into this new master plan report and really new dollar figure that we see before us, which is now 3.5 to 3.8. And also, I think it's important to note that Measure E, I think, was titled as school safety, for school safety, and that included the HVAC projects. But I think it's important to note that in the uh, previous few years since 2016 we have used Measure E money in part for our uh, school security projects like single point entry 
um, the security cameras and closing all of our campuses with um, f fencing to make them more secure. And I think that's important to note because unfortunately that's become necessary for schools to do and we've done it. And I'm hoping that that helps uh, people feel a little bit better about the security of our schools um, at a time where it's it's really at the forefront of of our minds of everything going on yeah mrs. Craig if I can comment to that that's a great question I just want to be very clear the promises that were made to the community with measure E are still in process and will be funded and, and executed with measure E so this but this resolution in front of you is not uh, money to complete the promises that were made with Measure E. So we will still be completing those promises to the community and completing the work that we had committed to the community with Measure E. That is still happening. This resolution is really to look at all of the new needs. All As we've, as schools in our community and in our nation have tran transformed since 2016, and the needs of our students and our community have continued to grow, we're really looking with this resolution to meet those new needs that we've identified since 2016. I, I um, appreciate that information and it, it makes me think of the past two years. We have needs that we didn't know mm -hmm. we had prior to 2020. So I'm very glad to hear that we are meeting the needs that were identified in 2016 and that also we are staying on top of things in the present day. So thank you. So just on that note, um, the education code requirements that you said are pretty standard that we've used pre previous bond measures. Um, for folks who might be concerned about what those promises were for Measure E, um, and the clarification of did we use the money, are we using the money for what we said we would use it for, these are the safeguards that put that in place. So um, so folks can read one through six. I'm assuming this presentation will be available as well as the facilities master plan in its glorious 488 pages PDF somewhere uh, fairly accessible on the Correct. website. Correct. So that people can look at those individual schools. They're all gonna zero in and mm -hmm. find their school and see what the assessment of their particular school is. Um, but about conducting annual and independent financial audits of the process, we do those, those audits every year. I think we just had an audit presentation just a couple of board meetings ago, but those presentations are available. The, f the findings or the lack thereof findings in audits are available for folks to see going years back. Um, and the Independent Oversight Committee, they report to the board, so there's presentations available for people, again, who are curious in the past of how that has been done. Um, they can access those records on our bond website. Um, perhaps we can, you know, have, a, a, again, an easy, accessible kind of click, you know, here's the, here's the 10 questions you might have about how bonds impact us. But just on that reporting piece and that accountability piece to the community, uh, that we're doing what we say with the money and the procedures in place for them to check on. That might be important for folks. Yeah, thank, thank you, uh, Ms. Curra, for that. All of that information is currently housed on our district website. Uh, all of the uh, Citizens Oversight Committee reporting for, for all of the past years is contained there. All of our uh, independent audit results are all, in, all contained in the website. Uh, I, I'll, I'll applaud Dave and, and his department. They do a great job in transparency and communication to our public to ensure that, that we can uh, show that the monies that we've been entrusted with are being spent for the projects that we've promised the community to be able to, to bring to the community uh, with, with these dollars. I want to apologize to my colleagues and, and the whole team here. I'm not grimacing at your questions and or uh, any of the comments that are being shared. I'm having some, some back issues here, so don't, please don't. Uh, interpret my grimacing as any <laughs> reaction not something, to not anything something we that's, said. <laughs> that's being said. Um, so I, I'm, I'm going to approach my, my question um, slightly different uh, here. Uh, at the end of the day, for me, Mr. Miranda, what I'm hearing from the facilities master plan and from this um, recommendation for a bond measure is um, equity and excellence requires resources. Bottom line. Bottom line. Uh, and, and the resources come from different funding uh, sources. But for us to have serious and deep conversations 
that align with, we just came out of our LCAP and budget engagement process. One of the big priorities, and this is community telling us, and it's a priority moving forward, um, is around the social and emotional well-being of students. Uh, we've heard how many students are visiting our wellness centers, uh, how much need there is for our family resource centers. We need space, and not just the physical space. It needs to be in alignment with what our educational goals and mission and vision uh, are. We can't do that. We cannot provide wellness centers in spaces that are not set up to actually provide the emotional, mental health, um, and educational support that our students and families need. Mr. Moskowitz, at our previous meeting, talked about this great, great thing that we're doing moving forward in terms of expanding our enrichment, right? After school, we need facilities, uh, right? Safe facilities to be able to do the kinds of things that one, our community wants and expects, but two, that are anchored in our excellence and equity uh, agenda. Our, uh, many parts of our communities, and I'm talking here broadly, Avalon, Lakewood, Signal Hill, and Long Beach, don't have any green space. Their safe havens are our schools, right? So if we're gonna rethink, reimagine what community schools do, we have the last two years, as you correctly put it, Ms. Craigett, to show us that we do not have the adequate infrastructure capacity as it is to do things like, and I'm speaking to folks that came, social dis distancing mm -hmm. at our schools, repurpose, reimagine what we do outside, right? How can we do that on blacktops where if it's 98 degrees outside, guess how much it is on that blacktop? So if we want to put tents out and have activities and do enrichment and or if there's a need to use inside and outside space, we cannot do that without funds. We have folks all the time talk to us about why don't we have fields? Mm -hmm. Why don't we have green? Uh, space at some schools in the district and we know which schools mm -hmm. which part of town we're talking about health and safety uh, right so we talked about sort of the educational mission uh, and, and and I'm using enrichment because if we're gonna have it at every school then we need to be equitable in what kinds of activities and opportunities and programming we will have but bottom line for us is here as a district we cannot even consider passing policies that are not yet before us if we do not have the facilities to be able to implement those policies. So we passed an anchor pillar equity policy in December. We can't do equity unless we have the facilities to allow for us. Yeah, we can pass a policy, and you've been saying this, like why are we gonna pass a policy that we're not gonna be able to uphold or fulfill? All right, so CAC recommendations are coming to us in, uh, is it uh, September or August? And uh, I think we rescheduled September. Uh, I am sure they will have components in there around all means all and inclusion. How do we uphold our aspirational goals around all means all if we do not have the adequate facilities to be able to uphold those? So to me, bottom line is we cannot fulfill our educational mission and vision. And so, you know, my questions are, and I'll, and I'll save these for our open session after five, like, you know, why the 1.7 instead of, you know, mis you know we have a $3.8 uh, billion dollar need, uh, you know, how, how this is then we need to do some community education uh, as well around the questions that board member Kerr and board member Craig had raised. Those, those are the kinds of questions that I, I'm, I'm hoping that we can engage in uh, tonight in terms of optics, perception of, hey, in the papers, districts getting all kinds of money, one-time money, why can't we use that money, all right? Uh, you know, vibe on the street is, didn't we just pass a bond measure? Well, just, you know, that was a few years ago, but uh, that funds different things that are still gonna be done, right, as you said, Alan. So I'd like to sort of get into the meat of it, but the bottom line is, if I am reading our facilities master plan correctly, we cannot, Quite frankly, the sustainability piece is a big part of that. Mm -hmm. Sustainability costs money on the front end. Mr. Marsh, mm -hmm. yes, there's a, there's a payout that we have to do, but then 
20 years down the line, 25 years down the line, 50 years down the line, we don't have to reinvest, right? We have an infrastructure uh, there. So I'll, I'll save those parts of the things, but am I missing something here, Mr. Miranda? Not one bit. So you captured it beautifully. <laughs> really not much to add on my side of the house. Uh, maybe two comments. So one, we do continue to apply for state matching dollars at, at every possible turn, right? So as we have projects that are eligible and we have district eligibility for our construction improvements, we try, and, we try and capture some additional state funding, but it still falls significantly short, right? And we're going to continue to do those things, right? We still need those local dollars, really, though, to, to make a dent into these efforts. The other piece I was going to highlight, albeit a small one, because we discussed portable removals earlier, and I'm going to pick on that example. Even the removal of a portable costs a whole lot of money, right? So that, that being a smaller project in nature, right? But regardless, we're falling short on the funding side of the house for these improvements and to get us where we just described. Dr. Baker, we're one minute uh, over uh, plans. Um, anything we want to highlight or share before we go to a short recess? No, I think it's uh, thank you, team, for the presentation, and Viva as well, just comprehensive in nature. And I appreciate that the packaging of everything together, so it's comprehensive in nature. Yes, thank you. And so we'll recess when you're ready, Dr. Benitez, for 15 minutes. Uh, let's do that now if my colleagues are okay with it. Thank you, Mr. Thank, Miranda, Mr. Rising.
Welcome back, uh, everyone. We will continue with our next board workshop item, uh, which is our board uh, governance, Dr. Baker. Thank you, Dr. Benitez and board. I am pleased to kick off this second section of the morning around board governance and specifically our transition to a more student outcomes focused um, board governance approach. So as a member of the governance team, um, today's hour will be spent in a true workshop opportunity, which is looking at some data, getting to converse with one another, talk about where we've been as a governance team, and then also think about where we are moving forward. And so there are three parts to how we'll spend this time. The first is to review our board governance journey, which is a timeline that reflects a full two years of work that has taken place, and then also thinking about the year ahead and, and where we will go together. The second part will be looking at the data that we have recently received from the Council of Great City Schools analysis around community visioning. And as a first opportunity for you all to discuss what you see in that data relative to your opportunity to connect with the, the community and ask some, ask some specific questions of them. And then lastly, we are in the process of making a transition as of next month to a student outcome focused agenda format. And so I wanna provide some public opportunity to, to talk about that so that our community is not caught off guard by how we will transition in the next month or so. You have three items in a folder there for you. You have a set of slides that you'll be referring to, and then you have a document that's titled Board of Education Community Vision Visioning Community Input Analysis. And lastly, you have a document titled Sample LBUSD Student Outcomes Focus Board Agenda. And so I will use all of those, and I welcome, as members of the governance team, I welcome all of the opportunity for you to turn your, your mic on and interject with me. Also want to just acknowledge um, that all of you in some way have been involved in this process. So um, Ms. Kerr attended a very specific series sequence of training with the Council of Great City Schools on student outcome focused board governance. Um, Mr. Otto is involved with the Council of Great City Schools. Mrs. Craighead was involved in our very first self-assessment of the Board of Education, and Dr. Benitez has been a sponsor in our work with A.J. Crabbell. And then to Mr. Otto and Mr. Miller, coming in to new processes, which will re be reflected in our first year of work, um, and testing out the onboarding process with us, providing feedback, and helping us to think about what we want in print, which shows the systems that are at play for how we, we manage as a governance team. So with that in mind, I will kick us off. So first thing I wanna reflect on where we have been. There was an opportunity as we think about continuous improvement in our district, an opportunity to, to take advantage of the transition of superintendents from Mr. Steinhauser to myself in the role of super, superintendent. Almost simultaneous to that, we had um, the new board members elected in that next year, which had us really thinking about what it would look like to become a board member after a very long um, tenure for Dr. Williams and Mr. Meyer. And so with all of that in mind, this opportunity came to really think about not just transition, but what are the structures that are in place to support an effective governance team? And I can think about the, the summer and fall of 2020 really around communication structures and what it would look like in an effective team, a governance team in this case, what it would look like to have good communication structures. And so many of those were developed and then developed with you all in mind from one-on-one -on -one meetings and from what the kind of information that you wanted to receive and then how we would work together as a superintendent and board governance team. The other thing that took place during that time was the thinking about systems and what it looks like in our district to have systems that support board work um, and work of the staff. And so you'll see in this slide pointing to the fall of 2020, where we started to have this conversation about student outcomes and what it would look like to go forward in a new way as a governance team. We had AJ Crabbill and staff from the Council of Great City Schools in to facilitate the, the first dialogue. Um, I can remember we had observers in that process. We were at Browning High School, really just thinking about what we want for the future of, of those systems. It was also an opportunity for us to develop a board handbook um, and this idea of onboarding processes. So Ms. Takahashi and myself, with some support from our team members, thought about what would be the first rendition of a board handbook and developed that with that included 
uh, processes and protocols, as well as advice from other board members who had served um, prior to that time. And you'll hear me say that we're now in the third iteration of that board handbook. As we have grown in our systems and our communication and in working towards more student outcome focused governance, so has that, that handbook reflected that. Thinking about this last year, again, as much work took place in year two as did year one. And so what this slide represents at a high level is thinking about revisions to that handbook, starting to really think about what goals would look like, SMART goals, as Mr. Miller likes to call them, and really thinking about students at the focus of those goals. Um, and so with the guidance of the board, I led off with some, my goals for last year, which you all approved, that in three of the six areas focused on student outcomes and helping us to, to think differently even about an agenda and what conversations would look like at the board level with those kinds of goals in mind. There were a number going through into the fall and winter months. We, we practiced what this would look like. We had um, now Dr. Brown, Dr. C. Brown, as he's been called, inter entertained um, questions around data. And each of the, the board meetings as we engaged in this had a staff report around student data. While it wasn't yet a monitoring calendar, we were practicing what it will be like to use a monitoring calendar that is highly connected to student outcomes focused governance. When we got to the winter months and into the spring, the board engaged in a very intentional process of talking to the community and thinking about what is the community's vision for the school district, which is a, a, a different perspective and such an important perspective for, the, for board members who represent a, a community. Um, in that process, I loved that you all paired up, you spent time in schools where you hosted meetings, you talked to community members, we had a consistent process for asking questions, which we're going to look at the data for. Um, and we also conducted a survey that was open for three months on our website for those who didn't participate in person, but wanted to really give their input about the vision for the future of our school district. As we neared the end of the school year, that process was completed, the visioning process was completed, and so today you're going to look at the data that associates with that. The second thing that happened in the last couple of months was a deep dive into this transition for a student outcome-focused agenda. That was with support from Mr. North from a legal perspective and going through every aspect of our agenda to, to develop something that is a primarily consent agenda for reoccurring items to make time, and I'll talk about it in more depth later, to make time for focusing on student outcomes as the primary feature of a board meeting. Um, and so here we are, thinking about the kickoff to 2022-2023. And I'm actually going to talk a little bit about the activities of this year, and then before the end of the presentation, I'll come back to this for more discussion. But we are in a really monumental time. So in addition, this, this slide is intended to represent, in addition to the work that you all have been doing and we have been doing as a governance team, you've heard that this summer it commences the, the start of our strategic planning process. And so important when you see this, this space in between, board governance and goals and guardrails and also the district's efforts around strategic planning. Um, and mostly I want to say today, this is not, this slide is not intended to be a roadmap. It's intended to be a glimpse, a glimpse at what's coming and how to think about each of the actions that we take as a governance team in relation to what we hear happening um, for, for strategic planning. Because in the best case scenario, those happen in tandem with one another. And while the district team is working on strategic planning, of which the board will be involved with, that we're also thinking about how to slow down or speed up the governance processes to align with that strategic planning process. And so what you can see represented is that we are in another iteration for board governance, another iteration of the handbook with feedback from the board and related to this transition in the agenda. This will be a time for board governance that we'll talk in, in a little bit about drafting goals and guardrails, which is a next step for the board in its governance practices. Moving into a self-assessment, the implementation of this style of agenda that centers student outcomes, and then an opportunity to reflect and to refine as we head into the months of, or the, the months in winter and spring. 
At the same time, and you've heard a little bit about it and more to come starting in, in the next board meeting, you're, you'll have regular staff reports on the strategic planning process um, that will engage right away, will engage community. It will engage students in, especially students to um, different than prior strategic planning process of, processes that we've had. Students will participate in really bringing their voice to what they want for Long Beach Unified School District um, into the future. And when we get to spring of next year, the board will have its goals and guardrails and an opportunity to refine them. The strategic plan will be brought to the board for approval. Um, and so there will be a, what I envision, a nexus between all of these um, procedures and processes that really establish the going forward for Long Beach Unified School District. And so um, I'm gonna take a pause and give the opportunity when you think about just the two years of work that we have done together, as well as this how we'll move forward together, just from a processing perspective and thinking about board governance, just take an opportunity to hear your comments, to reflect upon the time of those two years, and then to pr an opportunity for questions or any other suggestions related to this aspect of the presentation that you'd like to make. So I will open that up, Dr. Benitez, or others that want to share anything, ask anything, or just provide comment to your experience. Um, thank you for the, the glimpse, not the roadmap. Um, not only of where we're going, but where we've been, I think it's really critical. I think one of the first things that um, AJ said in our um, training around student outcomes focused governance is that student outcomes don't change until adult behavior changes. And that good governance, and he, it's a mantra, he says it all the time, that student outcomes don't change until adult behavior in the system changes. And, this, and that's part of that intentional shifting and focus of what do we as a governance team talk about? because we talk about things that are important to us. So if we continue to talk more about student outcomes, the idea that folks will understand that is our primary goal, is that we want to be student outcome focused. That's what we're gonna talk about. So we may, as you said, we're gonna talk about an agenda shift, may look different, sound different than it has in the past, but it's an intentional shift into making sure from the outside folks understand that we are focused on student outcomes as our role as a governance team. And that good governance teams um, are not accidental. They don't happen just because we like each other and we get into a room, but because we train ourselves to focus and to engage with each other and with the work with that student outcome always focus in our brain. So um, I think we probably all, you know, we're in this time warp of the, when we say the last two years and last two and a half years, I think we all thought it would move more quickly. Even the strategic plan stuff, it was just work that needed to be done that had to be trunicated <coughs> to focus on students in the moment. Um, so it feels right that all of that will come to a nexus in a time frame when it felt like maybe we weren't moving fast enough, but it feels like we were in a space um, that we can have really overlapping conversations around all of it. And I appreciate the opportunity um, for us to talk about it, but also to talk about it so that when there are changes and people see them, we've, we've had this opportunity to say why we're headed in that direction and not let people assume why we make changes to things. So thank you for that. So the, 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 the first observation that I would make was that um, uh, I, I didn't come on board until, in essence, uh, the, the winter of 2021. Um, <clears throat> but then I went through an onboarding process, which I thought was terrific. I mean, it was, uh, it, you know, the onboarding processes that I've gone through in other situations with groups that I've joined usually <coughs> lasted a couple of hours and uh, they ask you if you had any questions and you didn't have any questions because you weren't sure what you just lived through. Um, but, uh, uh, but, uh, but this went on for six months, more or less, and uh, 
I learned a lot. I've got a, a, a good file, and it gave me a good understanding of all of the different things that the, that the district does. And um, um, I, I'm a bit of a student of uh, governance, because I've, I've just thought about it for years in various roles that I've had. And <clears throat> one of the messages that has been communicated to me by the Council of Great City Schools is that um, uh, the way it works at unified school districts is that there's a community at the top, then there's the board, which is kind of in between the, the community and the, the school staff, the superintendent and, and her work. work. Um, and that what's really important to find out what the community wants and what their values are, what really, you, you, the board establishes its goals, but um, it does that in consultation with the community. And what I thought at the beginning has been made manifest in this process, and that is it's really hard to do that. It's so hard to do it because, uh, I mean, we, we joked about it to a certain extent when, when these things started because um, I think I went to the first two and then three of the five meetings and uh, dang, the, you know, we have 70,000 students or, and uh, the same 10 would show up. And uh, I w w thought, that's not very representative. How do, we, how do we get a better sense of it? And then by the way, other people show up and then they leave and, or they go, to a, you know, they go out of town. We did it during this pandemic. I mean, all the things that make it difficult, uh, all kinds of things that make it difficult. Uh, were happening. Um, what, I, what I concluded, it's really all about relationships, that you have to establish those relationships. And the, the very word relationship is a, is a difficult one because some people want relationships with you for reasons that don't have much to do with what, the, the, uh, what you're trying to do as educators or what we're trying to do to educate students. And so there's a it's just very, very complicated. And um, um, the visioning process that we went through, I was kind of disappointed in for all those and some other reasons. I, I got some information, uh, but I didn't feel like I got the information uh, that I really wanted or needed, uh, but, that it, but I also saw that it was possible. And, uh, you know, I, I've... Uh, talk to people uh, in the representative groups that we were supposed to talk to and, uh, and gone back to them. And, and, the, and the people identified as our community partners and almost to a, a person they said, oh, we didn't know we were your community partner. Uh, you know, we, okay, you know, we, oh yeah, we work with you, but, but it, 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 there's a communication piece that uh, just has to be central. And, and more stylized than I think that it is. And when um, Megan says things don't change until uh, stu student outcomes focus government doesn't work until, um, until adult behavior changes, I think that it's so crucial to have an ongoing relationship with the people in the community uh, that that, that there's an element of trust involved, there's an element of they, 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 they don't have complete access to you, but you need to be able to f feel like, hey, what's going on here? To develop insights into how things are changing. And by the way, uh, you almost, I almost feel like throwing out the last two years because of the pandemic uh, in terms of what it means because it's been so different, different and so difficult in so many ways that uh, yeah, I'm discounting uh, process in that. Uh, I don't know if there's a, if we if we can stabilize uh, again, but uh, but it's really important to emphasize that communication, developing those relationships with the people in the community that we can trust and who are insightful and participating because their kids are involved or they are the kids that are involved in this. But uh, it just has to be uh, a major uh, focus of it. I I I think that we've done. A decent job of getting out with what we can now at this stage of this development 
but um, we need to, f to spend a reasonable amount of time on, uh, on doing that. So it's a it's a really good point, and also when I think about the year ahead, Mistrato, um, this opportunity to get out again into the community and have support from Prospect Studios in the strategic planning process, um, relationships are over time allow us to to listen and to hear the perspective of the community, and so while the visioning process may not have felt as robust as we wanted it to. Um, it was a moment in time that will be followed by this ongoing opportunity. And so I think your, your point is really important. In fact, based on the relationships that you all hold in the community, that may encourage more participation in the strategic planning process, which will then allow us as a governance team to use that data towards what we want for our students as well. So important point that you've made. Yeah. Were you going um, on, Mr. Miller? So, first off, I, I just appreciate how, um, for me, I'm going to use the word simple, you, con uh, you uh, capsulize the past 18 months as uh, I remember every last uh, piece of these <laughs> moments. And uh, uh, I think that they have uh, uh, truly been, um, I'll call it uh, iconic moments to the impact of the board today. Uh, with that said, uh, one of the things that um, I was really appreciative of, and you already heard Doug talk a little bit to it, uh, was the onboarding process. Uh, uh, I was quite impressed from my experience, and I think it was both uh, uh, informative and uh, full transparency much needed for uh, us to put the names to the departments to the skill sets and uh, I, I just was really really impressed with that moment so I wanted to make sure uh, that I acknowledge that and as we look at this couple of pages I think we're only on page four here of capsulized activities there's also nuances within that that weren't necessarily talked about that are really kind of personality components that have been added to the conversations we have at this meeting and in closed section session especially uh, in regards to my personality where I know that uh, a lot of the team knows that I use the statement of what does success look like and everybody knows that that's what I'm going to ask and often that that question is already answered before I can even get to it um, and then also the nuance of uh, not only us consistently putting goals around our objectives as a district, but now the use of, or the terminology of SMART goals and making that a heightened focus. So those like small nuances, though aren't necessarily uh, as major capsulizing points as some of these are, have also been uh, major components to the uh, changes of the board. And so I just wanted to make sure that I acknowledge those and make sure that I share with you how much I appreciate some of those things. So I think that they are going to bode well for not just the team here, but uh, our colleagues out into the district as well. I'm glad you said that too, just to name that each of you, as I look at along the table, each of you has had a tremendous influence on what is here. So I'm, I'm glad you named a couple of those things in terms of SMART goals, relationships with each other, the mentoring that took place in, in addition to onboarding, the mentoring of new board members. So there are a lot of nuances and each of you can take credit for the, the direction that we are heading and where we've been the last couple of years. So thank you. Dr. Baker, I'm gonna direct my comments to my colleagues uh, here and, and, it, and it's an observation um, it's based on thinking about the upcoming year, but an observation from, from what I heard now and from what I've heard in our board governance conversations um, within the context of this uh, coming year. Mr. Um, Otto and Mr. Miller already referenced the importance of the onboarding uh, process. And um, as uh, Ms. Craighead and Ms. Kurt shared, you know, their experience was different and, and my experience was different. But I do think from a board development perspective, one of the things that's been important to me um, within the conversation of governance is having dedicated time at workshop, uh, limited at meetings, but you know, having time to have conversations amongst ourselves that aren't tied to different other agenda. 
items, right? Just on the governance uh, piece. And I think for me, um, f four aspects of this coming year, and, and you highlighted on, on a couple of them, um, is conversations around support for us as a board uh, on interpreting and analyzing data, uh, right, that's present either by Dr. C. Brown or, or any one of our team, um, right? I think, um, and, and I'm going to speak just speak for myself, I, I may be looking at data, not wrong or right, but differently uh, than either the intent of the presentation and or that some of my colleagues, uh, the lens that they're looking uh, at it. So I, I think it's worthwhile for us to support each other, but also have strategic conversations around, okay, what's the end game? Yet what does student success look like? But student success may look differently based on what my interpretation of our community visioning sessions uh, are. And, and not better or worse, just if it's a portrait, I may be looking at one aspect of the portrait. So I think that also goes hand in hand with support that we either may need from AJ or a strategic planning facilitator around how to interpret and analyze community input uh, as well. And, and, and I'm not suggesting that we don't already do that as individuals here. What I'm talking about is as a board, as a decision-making body. Um, and I know that we have resources, AJ provided them early, and we've had conversations around different metrics uh, that boards use uh, for that. I think it's worthwhile to anchor our conversations uh, along those lines. So those are two, right? Interpreting and analyzing data, but also interpreting and analyzing community input. Uh, because if our commitment is, and I'm, and I, and I'm and upholding that we will continue community engagement, um, it's different when 10 people show up versus 100 people show up. Process-wise, in terms of analysis of the data, you know, you, it doesn't work to do word clouds the same way if you have a small number of, or a smaller number of folks participating. So I think that, that's two. Um, with reference to the transition to the shift to our student outcomes-based agenda, uh, Dr. Baker, I think we, we, need a we need to continue the conversation as a board around what the process of developing an agenda looks like in material terms, uh, right? And, and whether that's the public, you know, that has come in and, and, and wanted to place items on agenda and what criteria, we've already established it, but I don't think we've put into practice, you know, what things do we consider uh, in terms of public agenda? And, and again, we have the words on paper, uh, but having a real conversation and also vis-a-vis -vis when we want to place items on agenda. So again, we have the process on paper, but I think we have to reaffirm and or remind and or detail out what that, what that looks like. Um, so in terms of the, the, uh, the development of the actual agenda, right? And then lastly, um, we have an example of it. Uh, one of the things that worked for me this time, although it's still, my preference is not to have it as close to our workshop time, the distribution of materials and any supporting documentation. I really have found the opportunities that we have had to have individual briefing sessions ahead of time helpful. All right, P particularly like the FMP today, but not exclusive uh, to that. I have found, uh, whether it's been business department items, we did the same thing for redistricting. We had conversations, materials ahead of time. Uh, I still think there's a, we have to find the sweet spot as to how far ahead of time it's useful to us, because if you give it to us three weeks ahead of time, we may not read it thinking, oh, meeting isn't next week, uh, but also getting it the Friday before is still tough, or the Thursday before. So I think that part of it I have appreciated, um, having an opportunity to be briefed, even if it's just individually. Uh, on, on, so, so I'm saying that in the context of if, if we are going to move which we are, to student outcomes based. Data, we need to figure out what's the, how do we maximize our expertise and skills, but also any prepared documentation, because I know how much time and effort goes into them. I mean, this is, this is a monumental task, right? And so just to, to either trivialize or, or minimize from a community's perspective, a 500 page document, I think it behooves us to figure out what's the best way for us to receive materials, make sense of the materials, and then be able to have a, a conversation, uh, right? I, instead of this sort of 
it's dialogical, but it's sort of dichotomous, sort of pre presenter, and then we sort of go back and forth. So just things for us that we've all said we want to do, that we've all said that we've committed uh, to, that I think that's, you know, my goal for this coming year would be to have those intentional conversations with dedicated time uh, to them. You know, I think it might be interesting. I'm flipping back through um, some of the notes from our first meeting with AJ, and so much got thrown at us. And I was doing it simultaneously, so felt like I had a better handle on it. Um, and looking at the Student Outcomes Focus Governance Manual again now is very different. Mm -hmm. And so perhaps as a board, we pull that back out and we talk about it. Because I know you're talking about data, and I was just reading when we get our monitoring calendar yep. in place. We're going to have a year and know what presentations on which data we're going to get for a year. So the public can wonder when we're going to hear about that, and they can look at a monitoring calendar and say, oh, that's happening in October. Yeah, again, we all want to know all the information all the time, but if we, if we really create a monitoring calendar that allows staff to prepare those in-depth things, we know that two board meetings from now we're going to talk about a particular piece. Um, and in the manual, and I'm, again, looking back and remembering you know how it how it is in an ideal world that when we have data in front of us that as board members we need to be focused on the who what why and how who are we talking about in the data what circumstances are surrounding the data uh, what phenomenons are helping what's happening in the data and what will bring out about a greater change like who's struggling the most who's getting the most um, what else do we need to know? Why did it particularly work in one place and not the other? Like We have all of that in there, and I think at the time it was presented to us, it was just so much new and different that we had done that it might behoove us as a board to go back through the, the, man, the out, Student Outcomes Focused Governance Manual again. Because also within there is the self-evaluation tool of how do we look at our own progress. Um, in student board will lead with one voice. Where was one I was looking at? Um, how are we leading with uh, transparency and including stakeholders? And it has metrics of are you getting zero points? Like there's those self check marks that I think at the time we couldn't, I couldn't wrap my brain around quite as much. And now looking at them 18 months later, they make a lot more sense because we've done enough of the work or tried to do enough of the work that I can see um, in our um, glimpse of where we're going forward, um, how that would look, um, whether it's adopting goals and guardrails. Um, but even the one, the board will devote significant time monthly to monitoring progress towards the goal. So once we've set the goals, we've set the monitoring calendar, now how much of our board time? Is it the board invests no less than 25% of its total board authorized public meeting minutes to monitoring goals? So we're, we're going to commit to a certain amount of time. That means we're meeting student outcomes. And then there's not meeting, and there's approaching, and then there's mastering where a board invests no less than 50% of its total time monitoring goals. Um, and that those meetings, there's the business part that moves quickly, but the bulk of those meetings are, again, talking about that. And that's the continuum of we're starting to get there, but we do have some materials that are from a from the past that I think we could revisit as a board um, to help us with some clarity uh, as we move forward. So if we pull those back together, it might be helpful. It's a, it, it's a great recommendation. I'm tracking on your recommendations. It's also something I'll say that AJ Crabbill from the Council of Great City Schools has been very complimentary of the work that we've, we've done in proceeding towards better and continuous improvement. He also has offered his coaching support to, to us as a governance team. And so that would be a really good opportunity for him to come in and do a session that really helps to do that. The, the year ahead too, I will I, I think of it as practicing. Um, so a draft of goals and guardrails. We're preparing a monitoring calendar that will then need to be perhaps massage to match up to the, the board's goals and guardrails, um, but a year of practice. And that practice should include, as you've stated, Ms. Kerr, um, opportunities for re reflection, and not just personal reflection, but team in public kind of reflection. So appreciation for that. And Dr. Benitez, I just want to name, too, that um, I mean, I love the request around support for data analysis and interpretation. All of us need that, especially when we are trying to transform the way that we think about data. 
um, that previously had a lot to do with summative data on an annual basis and the systems that we're putting in place now allow us more of a formative conversation with an iReady system that we can respond to, that we can talk a lot about. And it, and it, it focuses on growth and acceleration, not just the annual data that has been historically what we have had to look at. So I, I think um, all of us in the room and those who are not in the room today can say yes, that would be a great opportunity for, for support. Any other process kinds of comments or questions? Thank you for what you're I, Yes, Mr. I, I, I would just elaborate just a, a little bit on, on what I had said before in terms of the difficulty of getting the meaningful community input. I, I, I was assigned five groups to, to get in touch with. One of them was a, a, a Filipino group on the west side and I couldn't get in touch with anybody and uh, I kind of went to where the offices were. The offices weren't there anymore. I actually had a very good friend whose wife was Filipino and who had recently died, but he knew the community well. And so I talked to him and he said, oh, you know, that used to be the community, but it's different now. Uh, and a lot of those people moved out. And, and so the dynamics of, of this are just every, every one is different. And you've got to kind of get a beachhead of who's out there and, and how do we talk to them and, and whatnot in order to be successful. And it's, it's, it's very upfront loaded with time to develop those things. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it's just, uh, I, mean, I learned a lot of, a, along the way uh, in, uh, in talking to people, but it just takes time. And uh, that's why I'm kind of seconding what Megan says is you've got you've to really uh, devote what it takes to get to the place where your 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 people in the community are are uh, people that you know, uh, not everybody obviously, but so that you can move forward. And it's not just for this purpose; it's just on your in your job as a as a member of the board. Yeah, and I I also just like to acknowledge, in the spirit of what you're talking about, Mr. Otto, that. You approved a contract at the last board meeting for us to work with Prospect Studios in the strategic planning process. Um, our team listens very carefully to your analysis of things and to the way that you talk about your aspirations for our district um, in thinking about the redistricting experience as well as community visioning, both the positives and the challenges that went with that. That was part of the criteria that was used to vet um, partners paid partners in this case, but paid partners for working through the strategic planning process. So you'll learn more starting the next board meeting about Prospect Studios and their work in communities um, and with students and in harder to reach communities and the ex both the experience that they bring to us and their expertise in connecting um, with really diverse, beautiful communities like our Long Beach Unified community. So, but there, but we have been listening to both the challenges and the successes that you've experienced, and that is that has been built into how we will go forward. So, I'll make a transition to this opportunity just to take a look, a first pass look. And so, today is not a test. This is just a first pass look at some of the community visioning data. Um, there are slides that go with this. And you, your second handout that says community input analysis is a handout that also provides the same information. And so this first image was a compilation of the entirety of community feedback and represents the most frequently occurring words related to community vision. Um, it is not lost on me that the largest word, which represents the most often stated word, is around students. And while that might seem like an obvious, in some communities that is not the word that would appear most often. There are pressures and um, a getting off the mission of the school district that folks who weigh in on the work of a school district don't often see eye to eye with the district. And so with students at the center, um, I, don't, I don't take that for granted that our community is very student-centered, supportive of the work of the district, but also have aspirations for how to improve education and what they want for our students in this district. So here's my plan. I'm gonna go through the slides just to acclimate you to what's there and then give an opportunity for us just to quiet down, take a look at that data. Again, note not necessarily that you have to respond, but just any you know, ahas or noticings that you have as we go through the questions. 
So there were a series of questions that were asked in all of the opportunities in person, in five community sessions, as well as in the virtual sessions and the survey that existed on our website for three months. And so each of these is a, a compilation of the analysis that A.J. Crabbell did um, on the data. That data was in several forms. It came in the form of transcribed charts. It came in the form of um, documentation through our website and those who are responding virtually. And this is the, the analysis that A.J. offers back to us. Um, so the first question, I'll just repeat the questions. The first question is, what are your hopes and dreams for students in LBUSD? And both in the slides for the public viewing, but also in your handout, you have um, the analysis, the percentages of respondents around that question. The second question, what do you want for your child and all LBUSD students to know, now kind of narrowing into those early learning and elementary grades to do by fifth grade? And then a, question, a similar question, what do you want your child and all LBUSD students to know and be able to do by eighth grade? So thinking about our maturing students into those middle years. And then a related question, what do you want your child to know and be able to do by 12th grade? And then just opening it up, not creating um, a mindset that there is an answer, but opening up another way to ask that question. What do you want your child and all LBUSD students to know and be able to do in general? and trying to get a different perspective or even a more well-rounded perspective, perspective from our community. And then lastly, this question, when we think about our community and wanting, again, to open up the lens of community, what will bring out the greatness in each LBUSD student as our final question? And so I'll, I'll just um, want to take pause and um, give about five to seven minutes of either reading time, highlighting time, and then again, this is not, the today's session is just the kickoff, putting this into public space, what the data has been um, for the start of this next conversation, which the next conversation takes us into um, the board forming its first version of goals and guardrails to practice for next year. So with that in mind, take a few moments to look at the community feedback and any noticings, wonderings that you can do, then we'll offer an opportunity just for a, a first pass discussion for anybody that would like to, to share their notice and their wondering. So take a few, few minutes of reading time.
uh, or something, question three. Um, I, I think that slide has really moved, moved me. Um, it's what I also heard in our Black Student Achievement Initiative video about students wanting to feel valued and cared for and welcomed and appreciated and honored. Um, and I think that's the how that we get to the what, right? Being proficient in or about, being ready for, being fluent uh, in. Uh, so to me, that, that's how I'm thinking about um, the input that we have so far, right? That these are, question three, these are things that we hear from, we've heard from our students, we hear from our students. Um, we've prioritized, uh, particularly with our, with our restorative restart this past academic year. But that, that's the how that gets us to the what students should be able to know and be able to do. Um, in general, all right, and, and so that's what I'm thinking about. Juan, you okay? If I speak here. Oh, thank you. Yes, no. yes, sir. Um, often outside of the city of Long Beach, um, and while well, when I'm here in the city. Uh, People ask, why am I such a Long Beach homer? And I am. I, I love this city. Uh, I love this district. Um, um, but uh, there's a couple of things that make uh, our city special. One in particular is not the rich culture of, of one demographic or another. It's the rich diversity uh, uh, within our city. And so uh, one of the things that uh, when I think about as one of our roles uh, as part of that community and in an alignment with uh, question number three and what uh, brings out our greatness is the enforcement of the diversity in those cultures. And so to hear and see that comment in particular rise to the top as one of the uh, 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 main ideas within our community in regards to what they would like to see uh, and only further confirms uh, my thoughts and my feelings as well. Yeah. Um, and I, I recognize uh, the uplifting of our diversities uh, as something uh, our district uh, should be focused on, but I also recognize it as not just an appreciation of different cultures, but also the education of the many people that live in the city. And so uh, recognizing it not just as an appreciation um, or a way to show appreciation to uh, different cultures, but uh, to inform and educate those. So uh, I don't, I just wanted to make sure that that piece wasn't lost in that. So, so the, uh, in going through these things fast, um, <clears throat> what I came up with was that we want our students to be recognized for who they are in, in every sense of, of that word. We want them to be on a path where they're growing and maturing with confidence going forward so that by the time they complete their education, um, they feel supported and uh, nurtured, if that's, a, that's not a very good word. And finally, that, um, sorry, um, finally, that they're proficient in moving forward academically or into the workforce. And that's the, the encapsulation of all that there. For me, it, it feels like there's a real opportunity for our conversation around guardrails. So we'll set goals that are specific to academic goals based on some of these, but I heard some of the same themes this morning when we were talking about our facilities master plan, equitable access to programs, student wellness, um, facilities that support safe learning, um, 
And so as we look at what our guardrails are, which are those, those values that we need to hold the district accountable to, you know, there's, there's a lot around wellness that we wouldn't implement a program or build a building that doesn't provide a safe and supportive thing. Like those are the kinds of things when we talk about guardrails. And so um, for me, these lift up some of those opportunities to say, we're gonna create spaces. We're not gonna create a space that does not lift up the cultural diversity and strength of our community. That we would never bring in a program that would violate that. Um, that feels like a guardrail kind of conversation based on the values that I see across there. So um, it's heartening that there are similarities in you know the 604 people that they talked to about specifically about place. But then when we talked about what we want students to be able to do and know and how we get there, there's overlap there. So a real opportunity um, as we move forward in the planning and the practicing um, to look at how those um, can match up really well to support students. So I, <clears throat> I really appreciate that point of we were gathering this information to develop goals, but it also helps us in in developing the guardrails and I appreciate how you uh, <clears throat> um, Dr. Benitez brought it down to the point of it's the how we're going to get to the what because that's just as important as the what and what we what we measure what we look at is what will improve so to know that our communities value culture um, and uh, their, you know, language maybe um, that they bring with them, that, that kind of thing. And Mr. Miller, your point about um, it's not just an appreciation for other cultures or ethnicities, but an education, and that's the business we're in is education. So to honor that, that I think that's probably one of the most important things we're tasked with is how we do that. If we can feel, if we can have our students feel valued and welcome and safe in our schools, they're going to succeed. And so that's something that we need to absolutely focus on. And it does come up very high in each of these questions. It comes up very high. So we, we have to make sure that we're honoring that value of the community. Thank you for first draft thinking, as we often call it, and just your notice and wonderings. Um, I think something that I'd like to just point out, what you're doing and the continual observations that happen in the strategic planning process will help us just to coalesce um, this data with data that will come in through that process. But we're not gonna stop and wait for that to happen. I think that's part of the story of the last two years is at any point we could have stopped and said there's too much going on to make this transition. But as with other things that we've done, laying a foundation, taking a next step, trying something out and moving towards um, what we aspire to has been our way. And so that will, be, will continue to be the way of the year to come. And so specific to that, the last thing for us to just talk about briefly is this transition to a student outcome focused agenda format. Um, so there's a screenshot on this slide. You actually have a double sided handout that just gives you a little bit more detail of what this will look like. What's before you has come from a couple months of work, legal analysis with Mr. North, with Ms. Takahashi and myself, and really thinking about the aspiration to center student outcomes. And so on a sheet of paper, doesn't do justice, but just wanna be really transparent about what we're going to be trying out. It may be clunky the first few meetings. We may have to stop and say, here's what's happening right now. This is a consent agenda. But the, in essence, moving towards a student outcome focused agenda is a prioritization of time spent talking about outcomes and the monitoring calendar. In order to do that, something gives. And so our, um, the expertise that is supporting us in this process, the, the what gives is that things that are of standard nature, 
such as procedures, items not requiring deliberation um, that come every year can be put into a, a consent calendar, a consent agenda. And um, Brent has supported us in looking into all the kinds of things that would go into a consent calendar. What that also means is, as the board has done previously, you're prepared on the consent calendar before you come into the boardroom. So it's if you're voting on a consent calendar, it means that homework has been done, committee meetings have been held, and each of you in your voting, you're representing that you've done your homework and that there's no item that you want to pull. Um, it also means that if there's something that you want more deliberation on, that you've done your homework on and you say, you know, I think it's really important that we talk about this, at any time something can be pulled out of, of a consent item or can be ex you can ask for explanation by staff. Um, so it doesn't, it doesn't lose the transparency of what's on the agenda. It just frankly speeds up the process of dealing with standard business items to make room for more focus on students. And as you pointed out, Ms. Kerr, the more adult behavior changes, that is the way, that's in route to um, our focus on students changing. So two significant changes you'll see in this format. The first is under staff report, there will be a standing item around the presentation of student outcomes that is also related to the monitoring calendar. So you'll know what's coming ahead of time. Um, and in a best case scenario, those reports will be to you far in advance, so you're not just getting a presentation that you have to process and come back to the next meeting for, you're actually looking at something ahead of time. So when one of us um, talks about that data or, or collectively we talk about student outcome data and the programs that we're talking about, you have an opportunity to ask questions or to weigh in um, and back to what you shared, Megan, a set of questions that are focused on student outcomes. The second part you see, that second arrow pointing to consent calendar. So this is an example, not an exhaustive list, but an example put together to reflect what does it mean to have a consent calendar. So things like approval of minutes, the certificated personnel report, classified personnel report, instruction report, finance report. So while those things will come quickly, it, it requires that you all have studied and if you want something pulled out for further discussion, you do it. If not, it goes quickly during a board meeting, which in essence creates time for more discussion about students and about the work in our classrooms and in our schools. Dr. Baker, if I yeah. may, just on that. Uh, Please do. Uh, I, I think as an example, using this example, this also puts a little bit more credence uh, into our respective committee assignments mm -hmm. yes uh, right we had a conversation I think two years is Brent still two years ago Brent like okay when were these committees actually constituted mm -hmm. and for what purpose and mm -hmm. uh, so whoever then is on those committees uh, right you know, yes. if, if there are questions it's not just to staff all uh, right it's to all it could also engage the folks that are on those committees that have presumably met with staff mm -hmm. done their homework and, and bring particular conversations uh, yes. along that as well. Yeah. And to go with that as we do our homework, that if we do have specific questions that we can refer to the department who, and say, can someone answer my question about this? Those answers can be distributed to the whole board saying, a board member asked this question, here's an answer ahead of time. Um, again, it goes back into my behavior needing to, always me, uh, my behavior um, making sure when I read through that I don't save that question necessarily just for committee, that I fire off an email that says, I had three questions on the consent calendar. Can someone get me the information so that we have it ahead of time? And so that's, again, not something that I have done. I, I've done occasionally if I've had a question. I know I've, I've reached out to you, me on different things. Make this make sense to me. I'm not quite sure where we are. But really formalizing that as part of our responsibility as board members when we do, when I do my board prep, um, that I do my board prep, I fire that off, again, with enough time for staff to be able to answer. So if we're going to ask staff to get us things seven days before the meeting, then I need to be on top of it, read through it, glance at questions and then give staff a couple of days to, to gather that information so that they're not on the spot uh, when I come in for a meeting. Yeah, I appreciate what you're sharing publicly as well because I know from my interactions with each of you how much time you spend preparing for a board meeting. I see the way you highlight your materials. I know the questions that you ask. The public doesn't always get an opportunity to know that. 
Um, so th I'm, I'm glad you shared what you shared, Megan. That's funny you said um, the public, because my, my comment um, is in regards to the public. If we're going to be um, doing an internal email inquiry or whatever, that would be um, taking the place of our questions in, in, in the public meeting. How, how do we do that, um, or can we do that and inform the public at the same time? Because when we ask a question at the meeting, then everybody has the ability to hear the question and the answer. And so I'm wondering um, about how that's going to work, how, what that looks like. And then also, the items that are on the sample agenda for the consent calendar, just to clarify, these items would still be on the agenda available to the public. So the public would still have all the information. It's just that we won't be discussing it in detail during the meeting. I just kind of want to make, make yes. that point yeah. to let uh, the public know that the information is going to be available. We're just going to be voting on it kind of as a block and yes. not uh, going into detail at the meeting. Right, that's a that's a great description, Ms. Craighead. So everything will continue to be available as it is now. The backup documentation will be available, but it comes, as you've described, as a batch or a block. So voting on the consent calendar happens all at once, um, unless there's an item pulled out. But the idea is that when homework is done, questions are asked, You, with the, some exception, you'll pull an item, um, and that's absolutely okay. But in most cases, these are routine aspects of business that are part of your regular study and preparation for a board meeting and take less time when they're handled as consent. Yeah. And I'm glad that we're talking about the business committee positions because I think that's something most people uh, don't realize that we do as board members is that we all have our assignments as far as um, serving on a, on a committee. And as I think about it, I'm thinking, well, we have a lot of questions that we bring up in committees that don't come to the public meeting, but it's uh, clarifying information so we as board members understand the issues and understand what's happening. And we don't always bring forward all of those questions to the public meeting. That would really extend the meeting because we, we serve on several different committees. Brent, I'm sure you're gonna reference. I was so I was thinking. Just I want to clarify before Brent jumps in. Um, we're not meeting together in committees. Oh, right. We're each individually uh, on a separate committee. So yeah. at no time do we ever meet that's not a posted agenda item, nor do we interact on anything related to the business. Yeah. Go ahead, Brent. Yeah. Ms. Craighead, that you already have consent um, calendars currently. I mean, if you think, for example, about the gifts that you receive, if you think, for example, about the contracts that you receive, all those are already, I would call them smaller consent calendars, mm -hmm. and I regularly see you calling them out. Say, hey, I'd like to thank the so-and-so group for donating this, we really appreciate it. Or I've got a question with respect to this contract. And so you would continue to be able to do that just just as you've been doing. If it was something though that was going to require more substantive discussion, I'm not so sure about this contract and I have some concerns, yada, 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 that would be one that you would pull and then it would be discussed and voted on separately. So what you have been doing already is a really good example of what you'll continue to be able to do with this larger grouping of consent items. Does that make sense? I was gonna say the one thing and you're talking about how we would pull something, which we would always have the right to be able to pull something, a board policy adoption. So potentially had the equity policy come to us in this kind of consent calendar, I'm guessing at least one of us would have pulled to say, let's have a discussion about that one and vote on that one separately so that we could do that kind of bigger conversation. So it doesn't preclude us from doing that kind of pulling. It just, when they're, again, more standard issue. This is something we do every year. This is 
um, a routine thing, it's just one vote as opposed to seven separate votes. Either for discussion or in some of those cases for celebration. Like, holy cow, are we proud of what we've just done, right? You might not want that to be uh, in something like that. I think, for example, about our, well, there's been a number of policies that you would pull for just um, exclamation points and emphasis. So in closing, I'm actually, as we're nearing our time for this morning, I'm just going to go back to slide four, just as a reminder. So I've taken a lot of notes about um, the path forward and just your request for a review of the Student Outcomes Focused Governance Manual. I think it's super wise. Um, requests around board support for data analysis and how to, how to really look at community input analysis. Um, thinking about revisiting in the board handbook the criteria for putting items on the agenda and processing of things like the opportunities um, for materials ahead of time and the opportunity to ask questions so lots for us to think about just to name a couple of next steps so in august we will transition and we'll practice and be, be public about our practice of a first um, use of an agenda of this format and then also this will be an opportunity in the next couple of months for the board to draft goals and guardrails related to um, the community information we have now, again, as a, as a working draft, but to try out this opportunity to set goals and guardrails with support from the Council of Great City Schools in AJ and to conduct a self-assessment again after, after two years. So that was October of 20, 2020. So two years later to say, where are we now? And then to have that as um, for public consumption. And then lastly, I'll just rename on this slide, this opportunity of going into strategic planning and seeing the nexus between board governance, community engagement, and um, strategic planning process. So I imagine in the months ahead, you're going to feel that difference and be able to do a lot of sense making as you have done today around the data that we're seeing in that process and how it can be used to further inform um, the board's work in governance. So thank you for the good input today, and I'll, I'll pass it back to you, Dr. Just Benitez. as you were saying that, Dr. Baker, so um, since we're doing a practice run in August, um, it, it might be helpful for Dr. C. Brown to, um, if he hasn't already sort of seen this, to also think about in his presentation of data. I mean, I pulled out just four words here in terms of uh, proficiency, preparedness, readiness, and fluency. All right, and, and, and since you mentioned, again, just with the iReady stuff around growth and acceleration, uh, that's already one way of, uh, for us to align as we're developing our board goal, goals and, and guardrails, sort of how we're interpreting and analyzing data, right? Are students ready to do X, Y, and Are, you know, Whatever that is, I think it would be helpful to refer back to this as we're sort of trial running that August and September uh, outcomes-based agenda. Yeah, yeah. Sorry to, I didn't want to lose a thought, Dr. Baker. Well, thank you for a great morning on two really important topics to our district. The compilation of thinking about the facility master plan, the resolution that's before you tonight, and the, pol the resolution for bond that's before you tonight, and then the, the green policy that also you'll be asked to review this evening. So it was a really, really good morning of, of learning and discussion. Thank you, colleagues. We will reconvene in a little while. Uh, and I believe we have lunch. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Publicly.